Thank you! Hey gang, what's happening? What's up, everybody? Welcome back, welcome back. Wait, not, not drawing a... We're gonna hit the draw winner button. We don't even have anybody in it. <laughs> what's going on, guys? And gals. I see gals out there, too. There's women on the internet? No, say it's not true. Badstick, what's going on? Grins, a run-stop runner. I'm assuming that means that it's all, it's all 100 miles an hour or dead stop. Is that what that means? Kev Rob, welcome back. Chuck Whiffendiffer, man, sorry to hear you're having a bad day. Cheer up. We hope we can do our good for you. Drago, what's going on, girl? See, a girl on the internet. I know this because I met her in person. Matchstick, man, what's happening? Techno Cat, hello. Zydlik, welcome back. Death by Donut, holy hell, how are you, my friend? Sailor Jeff, welcome back. What's going on, man? Ravenous, what's going on? I am doing wonderful today, thank you for asking. Hope you guys are doing the same. Although I know that from uh, some of the chat already. It seems like people are having a tough day, so let's see if we can't make it less tough, easier. We're always easy around here. Ba -bomp -bomp. Is that mahogany paint you see? Always, LT? What, what, do, what do you think this is? <laughs> Jagero, what's going on? Non-stop runner. I say run-stop runner. I was like, man, I can kind of understand what he means. What's up, Irvin? It's mahogany you need to drink. This is our therapy Thursday where we just kind of chill. I don't really ever come into Thursday with a plan, although you, you, I'm a liar because you can tell laid out in front of you is a plan. I do have a plan. I want to talk to you guys about some stuff today. We're just going to take it easy. We may or may not get a lot of painting done. Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? We're going to do some, uh, some color theory uh explanations and debunking, I guess, might be a good way to discuss this, right? We're going to talk about some of the process that I use as I'm going through my head and picking out colors for particular models. We're going to be uh, uh, hopefully dropping some paint on our Space Monkey, one of our uh, Suriots for Combined Army uh, for Infinity. Space Monkey and uh, with Missile Launcher. And what I did in my head as I was going through, okay, what colors do I want to paint this guy? You know, what I want to do? And, and I'll discuss just kind of my process and what led me to lead, you know, these paints to the table that you're seeing in front of you. Um, <clears throat> and it's not, I mean, there's no real science to it, but we'll discuss a little bit about color wheel and uh, 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 HVT, HVT, 
value saturation hsv wheel <laughs> i never get it right hvt is an infinity term so. well huzzah huzzah i'll just throw back my legs and a man a plan panama tonight. let's do it and your brain is about to turn to mush grins and here we're going to talk about important things splinter what's going on man something just arrived in the mail what i'm sure we'll take a look at whip today I'm sure we will. Seven months. Sailor Jeff, thank you so much for the support. It means the world. Hype it up for Sailor Jeff. And that resub coming in. Uh, any word on when the slow fuse brushes will be done? I got an email back from them saying they're not ready to send me pictures of the completed production model stuff yet. So I'm assuming maybe this next week we'll see that. And then once that comes in and, and everything's good, then I would assume they'd pump them out in a couple of days and then we get shipping. So the goal has been July 1. We'll see if we're holding on to that and I'll have more news next week. Murder monkeys to ship. So hard to wait, Jigera. Spiky Bits, you got yelled at by an adult today? I yell at you every day. Sometimes not to your face. So this should not be new to you. Your doctor said your papers were not in order? I don't even understand what that means. Your papers aren't in order? Now you gotta be in charge of papers for your health too? I thought you'd just walk in and pee in a cup. It ain't that hard, man. Zydlik, you've tried doing some blending with blues, but they ended up getting a pastel color. Got any tips? Tell me about what you're trying to blend. Are you trying to are you saying that you're trying to mix to highlight blues? Is that what you're saying? Let me know what you're getting a pastel color with cuz you just by saying you're blending with blues, I need to know what your goal is, what colors you're using, that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Nova Foundation prize is in holy hell nice splinter. You got it, man. Oh, well we got to go look at that. It has to happen. It has to happen. The one way to force my hand is with good news like that. So let's go take a look at what he uh, what he got himself. Because, yes, Splinter MD won absolutely some of the coolest models ever, right? That's awesome, man. Honestly overwhelmed. Thank you so much for this and the support for the Nova Foundation. Thank you, man. Literally, it's not on us at all. It's all on you guys for supporting the Nova Foundation. We were more than happy and pleased to paint these. These are the Jagiri that we painted up. Now in the hands of Splinter. Fantastic, man. So good that somebody in the community won these. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely freaking awesome. And enjoy, because the models are fun. The game is fun. He got uh, both halves. He's not showing in the picture here. The other half that Dave Taylor painted. But great stuff. Absolutely great stuff. So, absolutely blown away, man. Good that you got them. And glad that they got to you in what looks like pretty much one piece. Dave actually plucked some foam out. Which is weird, because I sent them to him in better foam than this. That's kind of funny. Hmm. Oh, well. Maybe he liked the foam I sent, and he kept it. <laughs> but good congratulations good stuff everyone is angry at healthcare yeah you just pay 50% of your earnings in taxes <laughs> Zylix say the base is Cantor blue then Aliatok blue and a small amount of light sea blue trying to make OSL and you're saying it's getting too washed out too light um hmm I feel like anytime you're getting too light or pastel, you're you're lightening it up with too much of a color that's kind of like a white, right? Um, and so I don't know which one of those blues, the uh, the light sea blue probably is your lightest color that you got going on there. So uh, you're staring at them all day. I'm glad you dig them, man. You I'm glad you dig them. Like Irvin with a dollar thirty-seven. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you uh, you can attest to the thing that I tell you all the time. No matter what the models look like on screen, they're always better in person coming out of my studio. We have uh, we have the the uh, the porn star HD problem on our channel. Everything that I do on this HD camera, the camera is so bitching that it all points out like the pimples on a porn star's butt. Right, everything, every flaw in the model shows through saturation and everything. But when you get them in your hands, they're amazing. So I hope you're as excited about them as we were to paint them. Awesome models. Glad you enjoy them. Gouda, Gouda. 
Uh, I have a smoothie today. So. Donation received from Teton Servant. Starting it off odd. Um, starting it off odd. It's always odd around here. Thank you for that, man. So the holy hell, is that an understatement? Yeah, right. People ask me, they're like, you know, it was really weird. Like, I thought the model looked good on the channel. And then when it got here, it, it blew my mind. It's like, that's what I like to hear. But I wish there was a way that we could actually make them look exactly like they are in real life on the camera. I just can't get there. Invisible cup. Oh, it was. That's right. That's right. It's just like last time. It's the invisible smoothie cup, but you can have the x-ray vision because you can tell where my smoothie level is here. I don't have much left. That's pretty cool, actually. I think it did this last time. Go, go, invisible cup. All right, so let's get at it. Uh, is there any news we need to talk about? Anything we need to refresh, bring you guys up to speed on? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. We uh, are in the beginning throes of unpacking all the Vallejo paints and getting all that stuff up. We're going to attack that this thir uh, this weekend so that by Monday, all the Vallejo will be up in the store. Uh, that just takes us time. So uh, I think that's pretty much... Uh I think that's pretty much all that's going on around here, other than painting and working and working and painting, hanging out with you guys. Uh, am I picking up the 8th edition starter? Yes, I am. Well, I won't get it this weekend, I don't think. Um, I order them through from distribution, and I believe it or not, I think that probably the uh, we'll be late to the game on that. We ordered the same time everybody else did, but we're a small outfit, so uh, I'm assuming everybody else will get theirs, so this is normal with the big releases, and then we'll get ours a month from now, so I don't know. I'm not in a hurry for it, so I don't know. I'm sure there will be 50 million people all towing the line and painting new Marines on Twitch. So if you notice that trend that I never really paint the big hotness, it's not my gig. I'll do it later on down the line. <laughs> After the uh, the fervor has passed. Um, okay. So what we're going to talk about is uh, a little bit of my brain functioning, my low functioning brain power, my idiocy as I'm going through and trying to discover like uh, what I want to do is a color scheme. You guys see me all the time here on the channel as I pick up a model and I say, I have no idea what I'm going to do. What do we want to do? And somebody will blurt out uh, pink or orange. And I'm like, oh, okay, we can make an orange-ish work, you know? So you enjoy what I paint more than the big hotness? Well, I mean, I think it's all good, right? I just think that if, ever, if you go everywhere and everybody's painting Magnus, it gets old, you know? V Bosch wants some OSL. We will be doing a little bit of OSL on this guy. Not a huge amount uh, because he doesn't have anything that's like really bright. But things like eyes, uh, small things like that we'll work on. Um, and uh, Zylik was always saying he's having some problems with some blues and doing some OSL. I'm actually going to be doing Ooh, greens for eyes. Uh, Memnor coming through with nine months in a row. Memnor with the sub baby. Eh, awesome. Excavation point hype. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Memnor. Much appreciated. Magnus girly man all over again. It's just what happens, man. People get excited, and I love that about the hobby. It's just that I don't get as excited about any one particular model, really. I mean, there's models that I've been looking at for a long time that when I get to actually paint them, and Magnus is one of those. Uh, we've got a Magnus. We've got a Lord of Change. Uh, we've got we've got a bunch of those big GW models in the hopper waiting to be painted, right? And they'll be coming up, and I'll be doing them on stream. Um, but they are in a timeline. They just, you know, I don't really ever get pumped where I'm like, oh my God, I got to paint it now. Rarely. Rarely. I'm a grandpa now. I've got all the sub babies. Now I get to be grandpa. Wait a second. I don't like the way that sounds. Ray, you uh, tried the purple hair and darker green accents. Looks pretty good. Thanks for the advice. Awesome, man. Yeah, I think that was what was throwing us off. I really do. You're only medium salty. All your 8th edition pre-orders haven't shipped yet because reasons? Yeah, LT, I hear you. I, I don't even look. I don't even care. The order that I placed that had the 8th edition pre-order stuff in it, I placed a bunch of other product orders for the store in there and said ship everything that's in stock separately, and that didn't happen. And I've yelled and screamed, and that's still not happening. So, you know, it's the world we live in. It's It's questionable business at best for most people, so <laughs> you just live with it, right? Chocolate Gore, what's going on, man? Dollar thirty-seven Thursdays. Sounds like I gotta give like an extra, like a, I gotta upsize the fries for that.
<laughs> I'm not a grandpa. Bastards. Ugly, what's happening? All right, let's get kicked off here. Um, so in talking about color, one of the things that I do, it's all visual for me. That's why I like to have my workstation laid out to where, you know, you guys have seen my paint rack, right? I've got butt in the, the ass end of all my paints staring at me, whether Vallejo or Army Painter or whatever. And then, of course, I have a big sea of paint on my desk at any given time for all the projects that I'm working on. Um, and the, the key for me is that it's all, as it should be, it's all very visual, but it's tuning your eye, I think, is a big part of it. Um, a lot of people have a hard time just visualizing what colors work well together and why and making sense of it. Uh, Ray's uh, Infinity yesterday that he just mentioned is a good example of that. You have a good se semblance of color that you want to use. So uh, in Ray's case, let me see if we can pull together something that was kind of similar here. Um, we have kind of a kind of a bright green and uh, and you know more of a a, a, a kind of a, a purple saying and somewhere Aren't between magenta and purple. Right. And Thank you, Ray. Five bucks dropping in. Um, so he's working in this level, and then you know I think uh, like some really dark kind of gray blue. And as you're thinking and you're looking across your table and you're saying, okay, so so I like these colors and I want to make them work on a model. Then it's more about, okay, so visually you've picked the colors you want. You've got a story you want to tell. Finding where to place them on the model and making sure that it will work is a totally separate convention. It's a totally different way of thinking because each miniature that we work on is not, you know, when you're dealing as an artist on canvas, let's, let's start there. So when you think in terms of color theory, color wheel, we'll discuss some of that today. Uh, most of that, well, all of that comes from a land of pigments and painting on two dimensions, right? Painting on a flat canvas, painting on a wall, painting on whatever it was you were painting and creating your vignette, your image and story from scratch, okay? So you get to take these colors and turn them into whatever you want. And that's the wonderful world of art happening right in front of you. As, what'd you say? What was that? What, you did this wrong? <laughs> you did do it wrong. <laughs> Ray, $1.37. Thursdays with five bucks. Fantastic. I, I'm love that you're bad at math. <laughs> Bluffinator, what is the paint rack and where can you acquire one like it? Uh, I have built that one out of PVC pipe and wood, but I have a design right now that I will show you real quick. Well, actually, I'm not going to show you the design on paper until we get the prototype built just for reasons. Um, but I have a design for uh, an MDF rack that I'm doing in league with Luke from Black Sheep Industries that will be available in our store. It's a slow fuse gaming hobby product. Uh, they are stackable, nestable, so you can nest them side to side or stack them vertically. Uh, and they are butt end uh, dropper bottle racks. And they're really, really cool. So uh, as soon as we get that prototype done, it'll be on stream. I'll show it to you. They'll be available in the store. So just hold tight, hold tight. I'll make it happen. Uh, much better than like bleacher paint racks because they only take up. I think I've got them in the uh, in the deal. I think they're six and a half or seven inches deep, so much narrower in the long run than your your standard bleacher paint rack, and they hold more paint and they're stackable. We had to make them seven inches. Might even have to go to eight inches deep just so that when you do too high, they don't wobble. Leaning Tower of Pisa kind of stuff. I think that's cool. Ray, that probably did bang you up to silver. Hang on. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, my friend. Welcome to the ranks of silver. Fixed. Yeah, fluff. They're gonna be great. So I, I the way that I built them in in my design, uh, I designed them, and uh, Luke is is doing the prototype right now. Uh, the way I designed them in my mind was that you could buy one and have it be perfect. And then as you wanted to expand them, fine. They don't require magnets to nest them together. They don't require any special tools. You just slide them all together. You don't even have to glue them. They're stable, just slid together. We hope once prototypes out, I'll be able to confirm that for you. But I built them so that you could just literally, you get a flat pack of MDF. You slide it all together, done, paint rack. And then uh, you can nest them side to side, top to bottom, the whole nine. And we'll have other uh, nestable and stackable products that go on on brush holders, uh, paper towel racks, things like that, that you can build like a whole hobby collage for your desk and kind of arrange it how you want. That's coming in the in the near future. Camo Specs, what's going on? Glad you made it home from work. In one piece, too. It's in the name. Had to do it sometime. Okay, there you go. There you go. 
All right, so again, uh, the, the key, like I said, for, for like the whole color wheel and color theory that you learn in art classes, if you're a fine art major, if you've gone through classical art training, there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's also a lot of bad stuff in there. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about debunking some of what you learn as an, as an art student that is, 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 well, on the polite side, I would say that, you know, it's not as applicable these days. On the, on the non-PC side, it's just wrong. They teach a lot of incorrect material in art class because they've done it for hundreds of years. So it's that standard human fallacy. We've always done it like this. So that's the way we keep doing it. And it's just incorrect. Um, not all art classes are like that. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not debunking the whole art class world. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are taught in color theory that are incorrect. Um, and so whenever you take a look at uh, color theory in general, the way it was presented to use primary colors and their complements in order to get, you know, generate uh, a good visual approach to two-dimensional art, it all makes sense in your brain when you see it in application. But when you start painting in miniature, it changes some of that because we're not in control of the, the actual uh, base of the medium that we're playing with, meaning the model, right? We get a sculpt that comes to us that has its own dimensions, has its own shading because it's, it is three-dimensional, so it catches light and light performs on it much differently than a flat surface. Um, you know, you're not hanging it on a wall and only seeing one side. You've got to paint all sides of the model. Um, and so as you do that, color plays differently because we get saturation and desaturation of color happening naturally because of the way light plays with the substance itself. Um, whereas on a 2D surface, that's not the case. If you turn off the lights, it looks a lot different than when you turn the lights on. But other than that, there's really nothing there. Unless you put it in like a big thick frame that casts a shadow on it, you're never worried about that uh, because you're not really putting a whole lot of texture. Uh, on the palette or on the uh, the canvas or whatever that you're painting. So we start from a totally different thing. We have patches of color that are already defined for us in the terms of this guy is armor plates, right? So like most infinity models, we've got a lot of armor. We've got variations in the lines. We've got certain things that are supposed to be certain substances like tubing, uh, you know, uh, shiny armor plates or, you know, heavy armor plates. I don't know if they're gonna be shiny or not, but we know that there's some sort of metal, hard plastic, whatever. Um, a lot of times we'll have hair. We've got like the, the suit that looks like it has the, the muscle tone to it or the striations in it. So that'll be a different texture. We've got a gun. Uh, we have all these things that visually rep are representative of things we actually know about in our head, whether it's actual that space monkeys exist. I don't know. Could be. Uh, but we can identify with everything here. So you have a lot of direction already made for you in the world that we paint in. Um, yeah, you could paint the armor to look like wood. You could. Right. But in general, you're going to take it and look at it for what it is, unless you're doing something crazy like that and say, OK, yeah, the armor is going to be some sort of metallic or or, you know, heavy polymer, uh, you know, uh, fiberglass, whatever you want. But you already kind of have an understanding of what it is. So as you start picking colors, that might guide your choices. Um, and then when you have your colors like Ray did, you now have to think in terms of where do they go? Because as a point on thank you for the host silent. Thank you so much. You know, uh, Ray with his Infinity picked a good set of colors. I really like these a lot, right? But depending on where you place them on the model, right? Because you've got big armor panels, what color are you going to choose? Ray chose green, so the bulk of his model was the brighter green. That's fine, but now you've got these small panels that nest up alongside the green, and if you choose to paint those maybe the, the purple, then I think that was kind of jarring to the eye. And so yesterday we talked about that. It's placement of color. It's not necessarily that you chose the incorrect colors in, the, in your scheme. It was where you decided to put those colors on the model that then became a little defocused for your eyes because color's all visual, right? Your brain makes a lot of color up as you go. Um, if you get into the science of it, light, the visible spectrum of light that we are able to deal with in our, in our real world lives is not representative of every color your brain actually fools itself into seeing. If you look at the spectrum of light, it, it has an infinite amount of spectrum in that given area. But things like pink don't really exist as a light type. It's just your, your eyes not being able to discern or making up a color based on the amount of red saturation and blue saturation or red saturation and whatever other color they're seeing in the spectrum that's making your brain see that. So there are certain colors that don't exist in the world of light, um, but we, we still make it up. And so where you place that and how your brain registers those colors can give you that feeling of awesome or kind of what's up. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. And so I feel like we spend more of our time in miniature playing that side of the game than the actual picking of the colors, 
right? Because I don't feel like there's many people out there that just reach and grab really shitty color combos. You know, it's, it's tough, right? Uh, as I'm looking at my colors right now, what would be a crappy color combo? You know, maybe if I were, and I can't, I can't even say that that would be crappy. Like if I were to pick, you know, yellow and, and turquoise and bright pink as a color combo, for models that we paint generally, you might say, well, that's a little clown suit, but then you tell me you're painting Harlequins and I'm like, makes perfect sense, man. Like that works. If you're telling me you're painting Marines, I might be questionable, like what's that gonna look like? But if you place it correctly, like maybe I'm only using the pink as the glow of the eyes and now the turquoise and the yellow work really well. The, tur the, the pink becomes a really good highlight contrast color, but it's used in small amounts, like just for the glow of the lenses of the eyes or maybe a gym and not all over the model. And now this color triad works a lot better right uh, so you can't really ever say there's horrible combinations again it becomes more about where you place them on the model how far you take them in their saturation how far you take them in their coverage make sense so you know i trust that there aren't a whole lot of ways to really screw up color on the model now uh, somebody's out there is going to prove me wrong and is going to put something in whip where you're like oh my god it makes me want to vomit but you know uh, i i feel like it's harder to pick incorrect colors if you go into it saying these are the colors that i'm seeing in the story i want this model these guys i have gone in and i've said you know after sometimes i'll browse the internet um and i'll say like combined army or i'll say infinity and i'll just go look at images that other people have done and i'll see the way they paint their armies you know we've painted our eugene in kind of a, a green and yellow scheme right let me grab one of these guys so we've got our Eugene that we've started up doing in more military greens and dirty yellows with brown base. So it's got a very good kind of, you know, dirty, well-worn uh, field look out of it. And that's the way that's going to go. So initially, I tend to lean in my military colors towards greens and browns. And so I was like, ah, but I can't really do green. Even if I do a brighter green on my Morats, it's still going to not be different enough from my Eugene. So if I take all my armies out, everybody's like, oh, that's the guy that paints green. So there's that aspect. Try to find a way where you're not becoming repetitive in the armies that you paint. Whether you're painting them for other people as a commission artist or you're painting them for yourself is kind of irrelevant. Um, obviously, as a commission artist, you could paint everything green and they could go to all four corners of the earth and nobody could ever refer to you as the guy that only paints green. Uh, Elgato Diablo, welcome. Great name, by the way. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the family. Um, you know, but if you guys get to watch me paint here, so if everything I painted was green or everything I painted was blue, you'd start to think, well, well that guy only really paints green. Um, but we all have our colors that we like. And so there's that teeter-totter you got to ride, right? We have colors that we lean more to. I like dull military colors. I came from painting World War II uh, uh, scale models, tanks, infantry. And so that's the world I lived in. Panzer grays, khaki green, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and like by far my favorite military uniform is kind of the the sergeant's jacket of khaki color with the green fatigue pants that the U.S. military had, you know, back in World War II. That's like my, that's my go-to color scheme. So I have to be careful and not go there all the time. Right? 669, the, the ant of the beast from Camo Specs Online. <laughs> Thank you so much, Camo. Um, he said, kicking it with color. Definitely. Um, thank you so much, my friend. Exclamation point hype in chat for all the support we're seeing. But for me, it's the, it, so that's, that's one component of it. So, you know, you guys have to kind of be honest with yourselves and say, yeah, I paint too much blue. Or yeah, I tend to want to lean towards oranges and yellows and reds in what I paint, you know, because I've been painting blood angels for so long and I love my blood angels. And so everything I paint tends to want to be blood angels. And it's like, so now you pick up your new Marines, maybe step outside, maybe do blood angels and do, you know, black, do like the death company kind of stuff and do like, you know, black with spots of red as opposed to all reds or, you know, move into a sub chapter where you can paint some grays and spot it with reds and find yourself giving you that variation because again, it will spread you out and give you more color knowledge and allow you to kind of broaden your horizons with how paint works in this uh, world of miniature that we deal in. Um, so when I picked the colors for my Morats, I had to think about that. Okay, what have I been painting lately? I've been painting a lot of green. We've been painting a lot of turquoises. Uh, behind the scenes, I've been painting a shit ton of flesh. So I'm like, oh, you know, I know there's not a lot of naked monkeys in my Morats, so I don't have to worry about human flesh, but there is like red flesh and things like that. I'm going to keep their skin standard red like the, like the Infinity Box Art stuff. But for armor, it came down to most of the stuff from the Infinity Box Art is like gunmetal grays, dark blacks with red accents. It's very menacing alien style because that's the role they portray in the backstory. 
the combined army is the evil alien race coming to, you know, uh, kind of uh, put uh, to heal the entire human civilization in our galaxy. So the story's got them in blacks and reds and, you know, some of the, the Umbra Samaritan is like a blood-sucking vampire, you know? So it's got that really, you know, kind of evil feel to it. I don't want that. I don't, I want them to be militaristic. I want them to be like, you know, if an army landed on a planet that was dusty and dirty, what would they come? They wouldn't come in. Well, maybe they would. Maybe they come in big black armor and red because they just don't give a shit, right? They know they're going to trample everybody in front of them. So they dress in pink. I don't know. But I, I kind of like to go with a more fluid kind of in my head realism. And so for these guys, I decided I wanted to do kind of a deserty scheme to them. Uh, and so I picked browns. Right. And so for my browns, I went in and I said, you know, just find the three colors. And with Army Painter, they make it easy. There's a triad for everything, pretty much. Uh, I took oak brown, leather brown and desert yellow. And we're going to airbrush that over the armor today. I have a backup color in case I get to a point where I've done my base coats, my oak and my leather brown get on the model. And I'm seeing a trend there that may like take me more towards tan than that desert yellow. Uh, then I've picked cobalt skin because it's more of just a straight tan. Uh, you could do a khaki if you wanted to, if you wanted to get them dulled down a little bit more. So I've got khakis over here that I could use. So make sure that you don't ever be, af don't be afraid to interrupt your color process as you proceed, as you see things happen on the model. Because again, that three-dimensional aspect to the models that we paint changes the story on its own because it has shadows that fall on the model because of the armor plates. It's got the way it holds its weapon, all of that. You may think, oh, it's gonna look great with ultramarine blue. And you get your base coat of dark blue down and the way the shadows fall on it are so bitching that you're like, I really wanna keep it more of a midnight blue. How do I do that? And so you need to be able to, to kind of get comfortable with as the model starts telling a story on its own when you drop paint on it, allow that to happen and don't fight it. Cause sometimes you'll find a model being like, man, I started with a dark green thinking I was gonna highlight up to bright green. But after I put the dark green on it, it really made more sense to keep it in that world of dark green and switch to different colors. Um, let the model tell the story along with you is what I'm saying, right? Uh, so I chose the browns for the armor. That's where we're going to head there. Uh, it allows me to kind of accent that brown with the red face. Uh, obviously, the this is a Suriat. It's a heavy infantry model. He doesn't technically have a face. He's behind a armored visor. But we're going to paint the visor red. Uh, almost as if it's indicative of the color of the flesh underneath, right? They'd paint their, their uh, markings and everything red. Uh, I'm wanting to do some um, kind of, uh, how would you say it? Kind of Lord of the Rings, uh, uruk kind of markings on them, you know? Like they would take red paint on their hands and smack their hands on each other's armor. So I plan on doing some, uh, uh, some like bloody hand prints as their unit markings on their shoulder pads and stuff. So I think that the, the reds that I chose are Abomination Gore, uh, obviously mahogany has a base uh, and then pure red and we'll see where we move from that I do like it to get up to a real red on this uh, because I want it to be paint it's not going to be blood it's going to be imagine that you know as they go up in rank they get the the red handprint smacked across you know their shoulder or whatever uh, we'll determine that as we go uh, once I've got browns and reds set up you got to realize that okay well that's two colors that kind of move into the realm of warmth on the model so my model if it just stays brown and red here starts to get a little too warm and visually it's going to be disconcerting. I've got to find some ways to accent that with other colors. So I'm going to do green glow on the eyes and any of the armor spots that have, you know, the standard infinity kind of like light bulbs in the legs or whatever the hell is going on. I'm going to do greens uh, with OSL. So we'll start with a dark green and then we'll uh, glaze with kind of a mid-tone kind of grunt green here, this commando green. Uh, this is green skin for those of you following along. Uh, and then we'll go up to uh, jungle green for our uh, for like the centers of the eyes and the brightest spots. And then, of course, we'll be adding ivory and white in to, to highlight these as we go. I think I've got white out here. I forgot to pull ivory out because it's just what I do. Um, and then again, to get us into some cooler colors over on the browns for the armor, I'm going to be doing uh, some glazes of grimoire purple and cam dark green to give it kind of a, a corroded uh, dirty look, but because it's already brown, normally we would use browns to make other colors look dirty. Uh, if we were painting green armor, we glaze it in brown like we did on our rat guy a couple weeks ago. Uh, but when you have brown armor, to glaze it with more browns doesn't necessarily make sense. So pull some other colors into it. So we're going to use greens and purples mixed in, kind of like we do with flesh. Um, you know, with flesh tones like we do, uh, these browns are not too far off from a very tan flesh color. I know I just said I was painting too much flesh, but here I am doing it again. So the, the purples and the greens will help to, uh, to alleviate the brown getting too uh, 
monochromatic, so to speak. And then, of course, whites, blacks, and grays for the gun will probably also bring in a little bit of the dark sky blue uh, for glazing the gun once we're done so we can have it have sort of a metallic look on the gun. That'll help bring some cool color into the model as well, but not just remember the uh, to rely on the green. So that's it. That's kind of my palette that I've chosen, you know, and that's how I lay it out even when I do it off screen and I never show you guys the colors. If I've already got a plan, they're all, you know, you see around my desk here, you see the colors that I've got spread out around the perimeter of my workstation. And I will generally do that. I'll set the colors up so that I can see them visually. Here's my armor colors. Here's my skin colors. Here's my hair color. Here's my whatever. And I'll just lay them out there and I don't write down what they are. I just remember, right? Um, and so that's what we're doing here. And once I get all that set, then we start painting. But never be afraid, like I said, to change it midstream. So as we do these browns, I've actually already thought to myself, I might not go into the desert yellow. We might move the browns into a khaki or a light tan, depending on how the airbrush likes the model as we move. So, Righty. You're going to need a bigger desk, Matchstick. Everybody needs a bigger desk. How near is that future, Reiner? Uh, I'm hoping that we see prototypes in the next week for the paint stands. Um, and then as long as the prototype works, then we'll be building them immediately. It's all local. Uh, his laser is here local to me, so I can literally like go sit at the place and be, you know, putting them together. Well, we're, they're going to ship un, not down, un, not, they're going to be shipped to you, not down for freight purposes. And then you just build them. But once I get it tested, make sure that it holds up, put it on stream here. I'm going to, I'm going to do my whole desk with them. Bam. And so I'll be able to show you what they look like. And, uh, assuming everybody digs them, then yeah, we're off to press with them. And then I can be shipping them within days. Genuine, what the hell's going on, man? Good to see you. Hope your morning is starting off right. Shockle Gore, the weather sucks. Can't keep a steady connection. That sucks, man. I hate when weather interrupts internet. Although our weather's always the same. Hot and hotter. Here. Assassin Red, what's going on, man? Thanks for taking the dig at your Nomad scheme. I wasn't taking a dig. I was telling you exactly how good you did. And that how we fixed what the problem was. Because when you pick a color scheme, it's not that the colors are bad, it's placement of the color. Just using that as the example, you can have great colors that look fantastic on the color wheel or the rainbow spectrum or whatever, however you pick your colors, you lay them out on the table, they look great, but your placement on the model can make the brain not wrap its head around it, kind of like yesterday when we were both having a problem with the, that Nomad. And what really the problem was, wasn't the color choice, it was the color placement. So that's the only example that I'm saying. And I do the same thing. I mean, you guys have seen me where I've gone in and painted like a, a knee pad or a shoulder pad and been like, nope. And then we go back and repaint it. Because sometimes you can't even tell because you're working in three dimensions. Whereas if I were drawing or painting a picture on a canvas, it's very easy, very quick to tell what the problem is. If I am going to paint this guy two dimensionally and I paint a red shoulder pad next to brown armor and I can tell real quick, nope, that's not it. And I just go right back over it. On the model, sometimes it takes getting the model all the way through those shades, midtones, and highlights before you stand back and you go, something's not right. I don't know what it is because the colors all look good. The technique looks good. The blends are good. The glazing's good. Everything works. It's just that you got this color next to this color and the eye doesn't like that. Because what you'll find is with saturation, and, and we'll talk about it with the chart. You hear me talk about value and saturation. Um, as colors saturate, they get more towards that bright, natural color, natural, I guess, that we would assume that it is. So if it's red, it's real red is when it's at its 100% saturation, so to speak. As you desaturate it, it becomes less and less discernible as to what the true color is until eventually you desaturate it so much that you're into like, you know, browns and blacks, right? Um, and you've lost the pigment of the of the color that you're you're dealing with. So... As you, as you put colors next to each other, there's a weird hue transformation that happens in between that line, uh, especially on two-dimensional artwork because there's no natural shadow falling. They're both on the same plane. So if you paint bright pink right up against bright yellow, a weird thing happens right in between those two colors where you actually will see a third color appear. It doesn't exist. You haven't blended them, but the eye can't translate those values and saturations right next to each other properly, so it creates its own virtual color stripe down the middle. Um, and that's why you get, like you'll see on Facebook, you'll see those weird uh, mind screw uh, visual distortion kind of things that come up. And, uh, you know, like the, the spinning... Uh, um, uh, what is it? The uh, the spiral that always spins and it's in two colors, but the faster it goes, it makes more colors that don't really exist uh, because your eye can't track those those values as well. 
So that's what happens on models. And on our medium of three-dimensional miniatures, it happens quite a bit more because you have natural shadow falling. So that's why I say you won't see until later in the process sometimes that those colors don't live really nice next to one another because it was shaded. Maybe you changed your light, and when you show it in a different light, you're like, oh, wow, it's happened to me a million times. Right? So you'll start to understand like the the more like full body paint, bright colors that you use, you'll tend to narrow those down into smaller locations because they don't play as well with other colors right next to them. Things like that is what I'm saying. Squid Hammer, what's going on, man? Keep you company? That's creepy, but I'll do it. Zydlik, you have one of my stickers. Do you want me to put it on your Death Guard suitcase or your Night Lord suitcase? Wow, man. Why the pressure? Why didn't I send you two stickers? Uh, I'm going to say whichever one you play the most. Oh, yeah. That's my out. <laughs> Viking, it's hard for you to stop midstream. Say what? Assassin, what model is that? Looks familiar. This is a Suriat with heavy rocket launcher from the uh, Combined Armor Army Rodox. Or not Rodox, uh, Morats. He's a monkey. Space monkeys. Coffee and a little bit of early morning Mortarion. Nice, genuine. Oh, the Nomads, like I was talking about Harlequins. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember now. You spend two hours this weekend cutting up PVC to make a new paint holder for your Vallejo stuff, LT? You would have waited a week and bought the new one? Well, there you go. Fish fly, fish flies, assassin red. Well, the fish flies, it started up here in Michigan. I don't understand what you're saying. Fly fishing? What are we talking about? Assassin red has the weirdest uh, uh, spell checker on the planet. Ogre, what's going on, man? Welcome back. Slade, we are doing great. Hope you're doing well as well. Well as well. That one always bugs me. I feel like that's not good English. Chuck Whiffendiffer says the space monkeys must die. This is a common theory amongst the uh, the lesser known races or the, the lesser capable races, Chuck Whiffendiffer. Don't take it uh, personally, but you're wrong. <laughs> well as well. <laughs> exactly right. Fish fry. Okay. Fish fry or fly fishing. I don't know, LT. I don't know what it was. All right. First thing I want to do uh, before we start dropping paint on, let's continue on with this talk about color. I pulled up some uh, some things to show. All right. Uh, the first thing that I want to show you is called the HSV cylinder. This is a thing that has been around for quite a while, and it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot in, in most circles of art. Um, it has to do more with physicists and light interaction of color, which is what we see, right? As opposed to artistic uh, color. And um, I don't talk about these things much because I don't like to deal in the space the specific nature, I feel like color is more of a general abstract theory because it's happening in front of you, it's happening live, you're you're mixing, you're matching, you're painting, you're changing, you're doing all these things on the fly to tell a story. So I feel like if you get too hung up in the science of it, that generally you'll start tunnel visioning yourself and you'll make those mistakes because you feel like they're the things you're supposed to do. So you don't see me talk about it, but I do want to kind of define what I talk about because uh, a question came up behind the scenes the other day that I say the word value a lot and people don't understand what value means when I'm saying it. So the HSV that you can see here, you can see that the way the cylinder is pie sliced, hue is going around the circumference, like the color wheel, okay? So hue goes from uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, right? So your CMYK uh, color spectrum, which is for print, um, you've got RGB for your, your light spectrum, things like that. But it, for general in art, we use uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow as our base colors. The color wheel, if you're using a color wheel at home and the color wheel is based off of uh, 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 red, blue, and yellow, if you're using that color wheel, I would suggest wadding it up and going and printing out uh, what is called the Martian color wheel uh, instead because the and we'll, we'll get we'll talk about that when we get to color wheel let's just talk about this first okay so hue is color right so that's the variances in color that you get red is a hue blue is a hue so on and so forth so hue goes around the circumference as you see saturation goes from the middle to the out full saturation at the outside and and uh desaturated towards the middle of most wheels some are reversed 
for whatever reason. Um, but it basically just means that when you see that bright color, blue, pow, that's blue. That's full saturation. And then you start desaturating it. You start getting into the, uh, the darker colors where the color itself starts splitting out and you can't see as much representative blue, uh, as you do, uh, uh, you know, the, the darker values, blacks, browns, things like that. Um, and then you've got value value that we speak about around here a lot is the brightness of a color. So within each hue and saturation, so you have pure blue, you can still then take pure blue down to a darker version of itself and a brighter version of itself. Then you can knock that hue down by adding a different color and you've got kind of a blue that tends towards green. You can knock that darker and you can knock that lighter. So you've got this, this revolving scale that works for color. It's not just a simple uh, X, Y axis where you choose a hue and you choose you know a, uh, a saturation level and that's your color. No, now you can still go up and down, call it the Z axis, for value. And we work in value and talk about value a lot here because with uh, opaque pigments, value translates to that transparency, making things uh, lighter and darker to transition through shadows and things like that. So uh, without changing the color on your brush, you can change the value through things like our pre-highlighting that we'll show you today, stuff like that. So if you can, uh, even if you have to like Google HSV cylinder, HSV wheel, I forget what it's called, HSV cylinder maybe, um, and you'll get this pie slice thing. It'll just come up on Google. Uh, and you can use that just as a reference so that when I'm talking about value, as you see here, you can see that you're going from, you know, a darker yellow up to bright yellow, darker green to bright green, but all of that is within the same hue, okay? That's that. Bam, and then the color wheel. So the Martian color wheel um, is what I have used for... I guess since it's been around, because it deals with color as is more natural in the world around us. Um, I, I started mentioning the original color wheel. If you've got a color wheel that uses red, blue, and yellow as its primaries, throw it away. It's wrong. Um, it's been used for hundreds of years. A lot of art teachers still use it. If you go to art class, they still have it. It's incorrect. It's from a time when pigments didn't exist that allowed you to make blue and make red from other constituent parts. Viking Teabagger with a sub seven months in a row. Thank you, Viking. And Technocat, thank you so much for the bits. Um, it comes from a predated era where they couldn't make blue pigment and they couldn't make uh, red pigment from any other uh, uh, smaller parts. They didn't have the pigments at the time to make those. So the mindset was if we can't find other products to add together to make this, then this must be elemental. This must be primary. And so we called them primary colors. Uh, red, blue, uh, yellow were our primary colors. Um, the truth of the matter is that yellow is the only one that can't be made from other pigments, even to this day. Red you make uh, from uh, uh, magenta and yellow. Uh, if you take magenta paint and you take yellow paint, you mix them together, you're going to get a bright red, um, if you do it right. Uh, blue you make from uh, cyan and magenta. So you have those constituent parts that as pigments became developed that you could synthesize easily, that then you can create those colors. They're no longer primaries. And so what it showed is that magenta is now a primary and cyan is now a primary. Cyan being a light blue, uh, magenta being more of a, you know, a, a purpley red, I guess you would say, where are they on the wheel? Here's magenta over here. You're not gonna see my mouse cursor, but magenta is, let me pull this over kind of in the center. You'll see magenta over at about 10 o'clock on the wheel. And then over at two is yellow. And then at six on the wheel is cyan. And those are now your new primaries. And that really is the way the discernible spectral colors that human beings can actually ascertain. That's the way they work. Not just through light, but through all those other, uh, I, I, I want to say less specific, but that's not a scientific word for that. Science, physicists out there would rate me right now for... Uh, for talking the way that I'm talking about it because I just work in layman's terms. Like I'm not a, as, as Kenny likes to say, I'm not a scientist about this stuff, but I learn from scientists about this stuff. Uh, I was a physics major in college for a while and part of my wave mechanics stuff studied light wave mechanics. And so in that you start looking at the discernible spectrum of light and how it breaks out into colors um, and how those colors are used. The problem becomes that color in the spectrums of light is transparent, right? Light is not opaque. So you can't just work with the physicist's view of color, right? Um, the CMYK kind of, of thing, because it doesn't work when you start using opaque pigments like what we work with. If you start mixing pigments together, you're not going to get color the same way. You're going to mix, you know, uh, yellow and blue and get green. 
uh, whereas you might do different things in light, you know, in order to, that's a bad example because they're the same, but you get my drift, is that you, with, with physical pigment, they mix differently to get the colors in a different sense. So what the Martian color wheel does is it gives you hue, it gives you uh, uh, the saturation from desaturated to full saturation on the outside of the wheel, and then value, you just have to remember in your head, is how dark or bright you make that color as you're painting with it. Um, because you'll notice that on each one of these pie slices, it's not that it's the same color going from dark to light, right? Uh, value is not represented across the top view of this. That's all saturation. As you start to desaturate the color, um, then it starts to become, in most cases, more brown. Um, and as you start to uh, uh, pass saturation and desaturate on the light side, then you start getting into, as you see, all your flesh tones are around the outside, your pastels, we refer to those as. Um, and so... The Martian color wheel will help you a lot. Again, it's not something where you go and you say, okay, I picked red, now what goes with red? Because as you can see, everything on the wheel looks good with everything on the wheel, literally. There aren't colors that don't look good with other colors unless they're right next to them, okay? So it's again, it's about color placement. So I just am kind of trying to debunk that standard color wheel, pick a primary, pick a complementary color, go to work. That's not the way it works. That's the way people like to think it works. That's not the way it works, right? Especially not in miniature. You can pick a complementary color, and if you put a complementary color right next to its primary component on a model, right on the same armor panel, right next to each other, your brain's gonna explode. It's not gonna look good all the time, right? There are times when it will, but it's not always gonna be the case. So don't fall into that kind of tunnel vision when it comes to color. Uh, a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, I, I picked these colors, I got my color wheel, I get emails pretty much every week from people saying, hey, I use my color wheel, I came up with this color set for my army, I'm putting it on, it's not working, what should I do? And the first thing I want to do is have this conversation with them and say, stop the color wheel thing. Use your brain and your eyes and pick the colors that you think tell the story you're trying to tell. You want to, where's your army operating? Is it in a, a desert world, a jungle world, ice world, spaceship, cities? How do you want to do that? And, um, and then start building colors around the story you're trying to tell rather than from some color wheel that some art teacher told you to pull it from, right? And try to start telling a story. And then when you pick a green and you pick a blue and you pick a gray and you pick a brown to match your color scheme, then you go to the color wheel and you say, okay, I've got these colors. Is there a better way to define these colors that I want and have them work together? And then you can go to the color wheel and you can find, especially on the Martian color wheel, because it deals in like literally the colors on the Martian color wheel. It's, I think it's 120 colors. And those 120 colors represent just about everything the eye can literally discern on its own. Yes, there's a lot more hues. There's a lot more variances in the real world as light plays off of certain things. Um, but in general, you're going to find every color that's worth its weight here. And then you can mix and blend to get kind of variances between them. But overall, you're going to find everything you want here. Um, and if you were to go out and buy 120 paints that filled this, you'd never want for any other colors. Uh, because you'd be able to mix and match whatever you needed to in the future. But now you can go here and you can say, yeah, my green that I picked is a little too kind of leaf green. I want it to go a little bit more into like a brownish green. And this will give you that kind of way to discern and say, okay, I need to move a little bit towards yellow in order to get what I want. And then you can actually blend a little yellow with it to get the color you want, or, or you can go buy that color, right? But this helps in that scheme. So you're saying the only green that I have is this green skin, right? Let's say that, like this is the most green green that I've got. Well, green skin falls somewhere in the right around here, part of the color wheel, right? If I use the point of the, the bottle to show you, it comes right in around this area. So if what I really wanted was more of a brownish green, like this up here, right? Down in towards the desaturated point towards the middle, then I would say, okay, well, in order to get there, I'm moving from the color I have over to yellow is the next primary. So if I add a little bit of yellow to this, I'm going to start getting in this area. And if I need it darker, then I can start adding in a little bit of brown or whatever colors that I need that follow along that same edge of the circle. So you start seeing how that works. It's not how you pick your colors. It's how you dial your colors in once you've picked them to tell the story you want. So there, that's all I'll say about that. If you got questions, keep asking them. But I think all in all, go do yourself a favor. Uh, go print out a sheet of the Martian color wheel or don't print it. I... If you print, you're probably going to hate it because your printer's not going to keep up with it. But if you just keep it as a file, bring it up on your screen as you're doing your painting, then you'll have this as a reference. So you can always say, this color's not working for me. I need it to be something else. And you'll probably find that something else on the wheel. And you'll look at where it goes from your primaries and know what color to add to get you there. Cool. Cool. Confurioso, good, man. 
So I hope I'm not boring you guys. This is literally the kind of stuff that they don't really spend a whole lot of time teaching you because it's a lot of time. Viking with the 10 bucks. Thank you, my friend. A lot of times art and any teacher gets so wrapped up in the repetitiveness of what they've done. They've done it this way last year, last semester. I'm doing it this way this year, this semester. And so it just becomes repetitive. And you can take the color wheel and you can go pick your colors based on primaries and complementaries. And then you can go paint on a, you know, a, an abstract painting on a canvas and have it look amazing and sell it for a bunch of money. And so it works. Bam. And they do it and they teach it and they do it. And then you get into a different medium, like you paint a piece of pottery that's three dimensional and it all falls apart. Right, because the colors don't look good whenever shadow and value start being something out of your control because they're based on the light in the room as opposed to just, I put it on the canvas, they lit the room and the canvas looks exactly the way I want it to because it has no dimension to it. It falls apart in three dimensions, okay? And so stop thinking about the color wheel being something that guides you from the beginning and use it as a tool that assists you once you've started figuring out what the story you want to tell is. Make sense? I hope everybody gets that because we talk about this a lot. I use this language a lot, value, saturation. And I want you guys to start being able to apply that in your head as to what it means on your models with your colors that you're using. So if you see me do something where I'm like, what we're doing is we're setting the correct values on this model with this brown. We want the dark in the shadows. We want the light on the top, but I don't want to move too much in hue. I want to keep those hues the same. And that's where you start looking at color triads. Right. Donate five dollars to the cause and maybe it'll make you feel better. Thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, turn these off. Okay, so when I go through a color triad, you got to remember, okay, now I've got a lot of things representative here for this brown armor I want to do. I've got hue, but the hues are three different hues. This is not just a lighter version of this color, right? This starts dragging us into a little bit more green, a little bit more yellow than this brown, and then here a lot more yellow. No, no song this time, just a donation. And thank you for the amazing explanation. Thank you so much, Chuck. I'm glad. I hope it's working for at least some of you, right? I hope it makes some sense, right? Uh, the color, the cylinder thing as well, Terrigan, is the, the HSV cylinder. Just Google HSV cylinder and, and click on the Google images part. It should be the first thing you see. I don't think there's another one, right? That's a, that's a physicist thing. So there you go. Yeah, LT's got the link. Thanks, LT. LT, always quick with the links. All right, so we've got we've got hue here. We got three different hues. So these don't exist in the same line on a, any color wheel, right? These wouldn't be a pie slice. They'd probably be more like this, right? They'd be like, you know, this is in one slice, this is in another, and this is in another. And then you'd have other variances coming out from those. So, you know, I, I don't ever say just pick a triad that's all in the same hue um, unless, unless you're doing something that you want to feel sort of monochromatic. Here we want browns, but we're introducing new colors at each of our stages and also value. Value is darker here, mid-tones, highlights. So when I talk value, that's what I'm talking about, right? So we've got hue variants here. So we're adding in some other colors. We've got the desert yellow in my mind. I've got a little bit of yellow coming in so that I'm not just this dull dirt brown, right? I get a little bit of color in there as well that makes it, kind of brightens it up, warms up the brown a little bit. Um, and then I've also got value set in my triad. And then I might find myself, because of our pre-highlight, adjusting that, and we'll talk about it as we go. But So you can see this amorphous kind of process that happens with color, but you're in control, not some color wheel. That's really what I want to tell you, because I just, I fear for people that come to me and say, hey, you know, the color wheel told me to use these colors, and I'm like, no, it didn't. Don't do that. <laughs> Sublime wants me to talk about opacity. Again, um, it, which is a good thing. Um, opacity is the... Okay, let's let's do on a card, one of our, our cards here. And let's just grab a paint. Let's grab uh, b -b -b green. Hey, somebody likes us. Gosh, dongles with the best name ever. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome, my friend. Let's just do a spot of green on our, one of our, our cards. And uh, grab the brush, right? So I talk about transparency uh, and opacity, and those are basically just opposite ends of the spectrum of the same thing, right? It's the thickness of the paint, right? So at, uh, at full opacity, this is paint, right? Full opacity meaning whatever it came out of the, the bottle as. So if you're using a full body paint, you get that color, you move it around, it stays that color, right? That value is, is inherent to every brush stroke. Remember value meaning how deep it is, uh, bright or dark, it stays the same. So no matter how we spread it out, it stays the same. Now, if I thin my brush down with a bunch of water and I add, introduce a bunch of water into this and I start painting with it, we call this glazing, 
right? Where we thin our paint down to the point where it's almost not paint anymore. The pigment is very spread out. Now, it becomes more transparent. I can see more of the white card underneath it. Mythios, welcome. Thank you for the follow. I can see a lot of the white card underneath it. Where over here, I get nothing, right? I can't see any of the white card here because it's completely opaque, all right? So this black paper is opaque, but if I used, uh, you know, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Wax paper as a base. Wax paper is translucent. You can see through it. So it would show some of my green matte through the, the paper here. Same way, I'm seeing white. So here's transparency at, you know, probably, I don't know, numbers, 20% transparent, right? So this is probably 20% paint over the card and you're seeing 80% of the card here or something. Some, some ratio exists there. And you change that ratio by how much in our world, by how much we thin our paint, right? And so I can come back with uh, the same amount of water, but grab more paint and I still get transparent paint, right? I'm still seeing the white card underneath it, but now it's darker because I had more paint, less water, right? So I'm still not opaque, I'm still transparent, but notice how now I've basically created a situation where I have a, a full opacity value. So this is the darkest value that this green will produce straight out of the bottle until I start mixing blacks and browns with it or other colors, purples, whatever, right? So this is its darkest value, but now I also have its lightest value and a mid-tone value from the same exact paint just by how I thin them, see? So if I were to paint this on the model, I could get light green, medium green, and dark green all out of this paint, make sense? So if I wanted to paint a model in this color, I could start by doing the whole model like this, like all the armor with my, my green thinned down like you see it here, and I'd have the whole thing be this kind of light green. Then I could go back and then as I start working towards the shadows, add a little bit more paint to my solution and paint over it again and start getting this, and then go later on, I, I would never go with a full paint because it's gonna be chunky, but you know, go in and, and with even less water on the brush, start pulling out more paint, right? And you can still have it thin and workable, but get it very dark. Right, so like that. And now you can, with one paint, get all of those transitions without ever having to mix because you're working with opacity or lack thereof, right? That's the key. That's what we talk about here 99% of the time is how thin I paint. And I paint thinly so that I can make one color do a lot of horsepower for me, right? One color of green over the model starts doing all of this. I can get shades out of it, mid-tones and light colors out of it. And now I don't have to work so hard to highlight it. I don't have to find three freaking colors of green if I wanted that monochromatic green, right? I just wanted it to be green, but I wanted it to have some value, right? Shadows, mid-tones and highlights. And then all I have to do is mix a little bit of this with say, uh, you know, a yellow or something. Let's take, uh, well, or just grab a different green. Would be the, the easiest thing. And then I can start playing with the other color and how thin I make it, right? And I can start adding it. And because now I'm transparent, if I start moving that yellow through my green and then finally back up to yellow, I get some really cool blends that come out of it. And now I have a third color, right? I've got my original green, I've got this yellowish green, and then that translates up into the yellow. Right? Or, well, in this case, it was actually like a, a slime green color or whatever. Right? But because I'm playing transparent, right? notice how I can see my green showing up through my yellow, and I actually get a different color. That's the way light works, right? Because light is transparent. So when you blend light together, that's how it mixes. And that's why um, like full body pigments mix differently because you don't get that. You, you, you have to stir them together in order to get the other color. Whereas the way we paint on the model, I'm able to get another color even after a paint has dried. That green was dry, but I came back over it with a wet yellow and now I get a third color, right? I get a greenish yellow. Now, obviously you don't want this dark line. So we'll talk about that in the process of how we use brush strokes in order to hide that. So you don't get these, you know, your blend lines go away very nicely, right? So if I were actually doing this in the real world, I would thin down my green, you know, I'd paint a little bit of green out here and then I'd immediately go over and use a bunch of the thin yellow, right? And then I could just work them together before they dry to get that same transition, but now I don't have a hard line, right? But I let my green dry completely, so I kind of screwed the pooch on that one. Right? But you can do this and blend on the model and still retain whatever was underneath it, right? So if I wanted to paint this over that gold that's up here as we go crazy. Right, I can go with a very thin green over my copper paint that I had from yesterday. Right, and I get a really crazy tarnished looking copper, which is exactly what we did on the model when we were painting with those metallics because of transparency. 
Transparency and opacity, same exact words. Uh, it's just that transparent is as you lose opacity, you become transparent. As you gain opacity, you become opaque. Make sense? There will be a quiz at the end of the day. <laughs> fish flies are an insect. Oh, so you actually meant to say fish fly. So it's like a midge. Nice, Chuck. I will definitely try to remember to save this one out for YouTube so that you guys can use it as a way to go back and uh, and catch this over there, even though I know it's a little disoriented because YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you don't know who I'm talking to in chat. So, <laughs> but hopefully this helps. We'll put it over on the, on the YouTubes. You're loving every minute of color theory. Nice, nice, Ray. How many credits do you get for watching this stream? It's called continuing education. You don't really get credits for it, but tell your boss you're smarter now and they should pay you more. Get some paint on that model, says VBot. He's like, shut up and start painting. Can we get a free slow fuse color theory graduate degree or certificate in the mail? I should probably. I should send everybody a copy of the Martian color wheel and the HSV cylinder along with a, a, a stamp of approval. <laughs> with a bomb snail stamp of approval. <laughs> so what lighting should we be painting on for miniatures? Death by Donut, what are you talking about? What lighting should we be using for painting miniatures? Gosh, dongles. It's a, one of the best names ever. Rizog, what's going on, man? Um, if you're asking me what type of light you should use, that's a good question. I, I tend to like the new LEDs uh, because of temperature control and LED responsiveness stays static across the life of the LED. Until the LED burns out, it gives the exact same uh, quality of light. Um, they don't they don't dim or or change like an incandescent or a fluorescent does. As a as a fluorescent light, uh, as the uh, the compact fluorescent with the ballast, as the ballast ages, the temperature of the light can change. Um, and so I don't, I don't like those. They're good for backlighting. Like we're using uh, compact fluorescent and this light that you can see bouncing off of my hand up here. That light hits the green screen and makes sure that the green screen works. It also kind of backlights, you know, the, the sides of me. So it's good fill light. Um, but I feel like LEDs are what you should be using when you're painting. Uh, don't use the fluorescent daylight bulbs. Again, they're, they're kind of wonky over time. We just have better technology now. And with the LEDs, you can pick up like this, what is this one, the Taltronics light that I use. It's this thing that's, you know, the long uh, uh, stick light that has probably two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, looks like 18 or 20 uh, white blue LEDs and then probably 10 yellow LEDs. So you can still change the color. Let me, let me turn this lamp down. And then on this one, you can see there's just white Here's white with the yellow, right? And then they have all yellow, right? So this one will even change temperature on you, right? That's the combo. That's the all white. That's the all yellow, right? And if we put colored models underneath that, let's grab a, a something that actually has color on. Oh, this will be good. Grab big dude's legs with the turquoise, right? So you can see how the, the lamp will alter the color. So that's all yellow, very warm temperature uh, color. And then there's all white. Notice the change in the reds. Pay particular attention to the reds. The reds become a little bit more orange when I put the uh, the yellow lamp on them. So it will change because they're not, they don't look like that in real life. That's more what it looks like, but honestly the blend, that's what you really have in front of you. So it's being able to get that color temperature to be kind of in the, the mid tonal. I don't know what the temperature of this light is when using both of the bulbs, but that's better. Now let me turn that one off and I'll show you my film light, right? This is the big one that I use. This is the main workspace light that I use. The other one is for backfill. Uh, this light, if I go all the way to warm, same effect, right? This one's just more intense, right? So you start seeing the turquoises take on a little bit of a goldy glow because all the light is reflecting off of them and you get that color from the light. So you don't want your lamp to introduce color onto your model that doesn't actually exist if you can avoid it. So not too much white, not too much yellows, Right? And that's why I'll put it probably about 50-50 like that. And then it also has a dimmer so that I can, you know, saturate or desaturate. And you'll notice that like whites and ivories and stuff start to desaturate real quick. So that is probably the best lamp that you can use. Uh, again, these are like 300 bucks. They're an investment, but they're really good. They're good on your eyes too because you can dim them and because of the color temp. You know, you've seen me when I'm working on just 
uh, colors in the blue range. Uh, I might go more towards warm lighting so that the blues look more realistic for you guys on camera. I can basically adjust how my camera's white balance works by adjusting the light in the background rather than having to jump to the white balance setting on my camera. Come back on and that's the complete picture. I normally do like that. There you go. So now with the fill light coming back from back here, you can see that other lamp is, is creating light in the backdrop, right? So it not only helps eliminate shadows for the video, but it also backlights for me so that I'm not getting crazy shadows on the model. I want light from all directions. Some people have been building those LED domes over their workspace, which are really cool. But again, you got to pick the color of your LED. If you could do that and do it properly, you'd be able to put a rheostat on there. It's not really a rheostat, but you'd be able to put like a, a triac dimming system on there so that the LEDs, you could, you could dim them between the white and the yellow. But nobody makes one like that. Kevrob, where did I get the color wheel from? I've had that graphic forever. I had to pull off my other computer. Again, if you uh, Google Martian color wheel, M-A-R-T-I-A-N, Martian, just like you would assume, Martian color wheel. The guy that made it, his last name was Mars, I think, which is why it's called the Martian color wheel. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's the case. A uh, Falcomac, any pointers for brush control for fine details? A world of them, man. Um, steady hand is the best thing. So anything you can do to uh, steeple your hand as you work is is the best thing that I can tell you. I work at a stand up desk. You can see here, I'm like, I'm st I'm standing, right? So, like, I foot floor way down there. So I'm on my stand up desk, and for me, it makes it very very easy to create a nice cradle. Um, for painting, right? Because my arm is literally flat from the elbow across the table right here. And so this hand is very solid and it gives me a base where I can then come in and uh, use that hand, right? As opposed to if I were sitting and I had my hand up in the air like this and I've got to kind of steeple my fingers on it. Now I've got two things that can move right here. You'll see me when I'm painting my fine detail, my whole hand is anchored to the table. And then you steeple off of it. So you'll find me just kind of unknowingly, this subconsciously, I'll, I'll usually put my, my pinky on a, on a finger and then another one on my thumb, you know? And then it's about how you grip the brush, how far down the, uh, the barrel of the brush that I'm going. If I'm doing like a very short, fine detail, like an eye, you'll see me go in and put my finger almost at the end of the ferrule, right? And then I'll go in and steady my hand and then just get in very close and dot you know, if I'm just doing one small detail. If I'm doing a longer detail, I'll pull my fingers back a little bit and use them as a normal pencil grip and leverage. And then I'll use that to kind of pull my sweep down a particular area. I'll move the model a lot, right? So that it's much easier for you to pull a vertical line for most people. So I'll, I'll move it to where my panel edge is vertical. I say vertical is just allowing me to pull a vertical line, right? So like if I wanna do this panel here across the top of the thigh, I would do it, hold the model this way so that I could pull that line like this, as opposed to like this, unless I can get the edge of the brush. If using the edge of the brush, then you can make it horizontal. So you can use the edge of the brush like this. But if I were having to paint this with the tip of the brush, painting horizontal is very, very hard for most people. So always rotate the model so that you can pull a vertical line much easier to stabilize and to keep your hand in one continual motion to go vertical because you can basically just draw the brush. If you can get the model set right, you can basically just pull the brush backwards over your finger and it never moves left or right. And that'll give you a line, right? So again, it's just technique for, you know, how your fingers work. I've got, um, I've got fairly dexterous hands. I know that sounds funny to say, but I've always done very fine work with my hands. Uh, uh, this, thank God when I was playing hockey, I didn't bust all my fingers all the time. But, uh, you know, so I still have very good motion in my hands. And a lot of it is just being able to get, you know, that dexterous control, be able to do things like sweep the brush horizontally and then pull to make, you know, like a, a if you wanted to make like a horseshoe shape, right? You know how to just basically push and pull the brush to get a continual flow. So uh, practice, practice, practice but steadying the, the area that you work in. For me, a standing desk changed the way I painted because it gave me so much more ability to stabilize without hunching over and being uncomfortable. 
and doing all those things that fatigue you. So at the end of the day, you feel like you got punched in the nuts and all you've been doing is painting at a table. So. And a lot of the guys on here that have switched over to standing desk would swear by them too. Oh, what's happening? All right, let's paint. So the first thing we're going to do is focus on getting some highlights on this guy with the airbrush. We'll do some white. For those of you that may be new here, I basically pre-highlight most of my models. Uh, it's a rarity when I don't pre-highlight. And uh, by pre-highlight, I mean that I use the airbrush and I go in with white and I dust the model first to get sort of this gray transition over my black. I always use black primer. Um, and then uh, layer the white until I get to bright white to set up my value again. There's that word, right, that we were just talking about. Value meaning light to dark on the model. So where do your shadows fall? Right, obviously on the low parts for most models because we're using a general topical lighting for most everything, unless there's some weird, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, OSL glow that we're doing that's directional or something like that. Um, but most cases we're just doing light from the top, and that's what we'll be doing today. So I'm going to set up just like we did on that little robot guy on our Mobrat. On a little bit of water through my brush just to make sure. I can't remember if I had airbrush cleaner in this thing last or water. So water first. Good habit to get into. If you have airbrush cleaner still sitting in your airbrush and then you go to spray on your model, you're going to hate yourself. It does not work very well when mixed with paint. And then white. And our white that we're using is going to be our titanium custom mix that we did. I say custom mix. It's literally just titanium white and airbrush medium. Um, so golden airbrush medium is what I prefer. You can use the Liquitex. Vallejo's got a, a medium as well. Uh, and then just cheapo titanium white, 399 for however big this damn tube is. Four, four fluid ounces, 120 mil of titanium white from the art store for four bucks. And it'll give you 100 million bottles of white there. <laughs> Probably not 100 million, but close. I got your message, Key. Jagera, was I able to get Scale 75 for the store? Those guys will not answer me on a consistent basis, so I'm very, very leery of ordering from them at this point. Uh, just because I'm worried right now as we sell out, will they be able to restock? They don't answer me, like, hardly at all, which is a bummer. I'm hoping that maybe it's just because they had their Kickstarter going, whatever. But it's a very small company. Um, I'm always kind of afraid of working with very small companies. I love them. But uh, we'll see. There's my non-committal answer. My answer is that I still hope I can bring Scale 75 to the store. Nothing's changed. Uh, world's best brush. Right? You guys will never be able to afford a brush like this, so don't even ask. Just hope that someday you can get one gifted to you. Uh, that's what I use to stir the paint in the pot. Gappa. Worst brush ever. But it does its job... That was white and flow improver. Probably, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, two drops of white and a bunch of drops of flow improver. I always say 80 20 paint to flow imp or flow improver to paint. So we're going to stick with that calculation. All right. Now, um, let's go ahead while we're on the, the, the teaching tip here. Let's go ahead and, and kind of do our thing. Uh, one of the ways that I tell people to do this as you're getting used to it, you'll see me hold the model and flip it around a lot, but uh, for a lot of people as you're starting to do pre-highlight, easy thing to do is to mark your model on your workspace. Right? So I just use a Sharpie and draw, trace around the base, bingo like that, and pick where you want the light to come from. He's got his missile launcher, heavy rocket launcher over there. So let's have the light coming off of his right shoulder. So I'm just going to position the model like this, draw myself an arrow, and then draw a mark on the base. Right? That, and you'll notice I've just put a little bit of a marker on the base and an arrow on my workspace so I know where to line those up. So I can take the model, look at it, figure out what I'm doing, and then I can always put it back at the same orientation. Make sense? And the arrow is the direction of your light. That's where you're going to be pointing your airbrush. Right? And then as I back back out, so what I'll do is for me, I'm always generally taking my airbrush, and for me, this is eight inches, right? If I do the horns, woo, that's the, the, the hang 10. That's eight inches. So I can put my brush somewhere in that eight to seven inches kind of range away from the model, height-wise off of the table. Don't vary that height. The key to what I'm about to do is keeping your height as close to that level as you can, right? So you don't want to come down here and start spraying because then it's going to oversaturate your white and it's going to change your shadow angle. 
the sun doesn't change its, I mean, the sun does change angle in the sky, obviously gets lower on the horizon and the shadows get longer. So you can imagine that as, as uh, you change your angle with your airbrush, your shadows change direction too. So you want it consistent because we don't have a lot of space to work with. So the more variance you have with height, the less actual cool shadow you're going to get on the model, right? So the first thing I'll do is I'll take it, make sure I'm getting some paint, and then I'll hold it up here and I'll just give it a light dusting, right? So you'll start seeing a little bit of white up on the shoulders and the head, the gun. Again, I'm running my white very, very thin, so it's going to take it a while to build up. And as it's so thin, you'll notice that it's starting to dust all the way down. And now what I want to do, because I want to get some on the feet, is I want to pull the brush back. I don't want to go low, because remember, I just told you that's going to screw your shadows up. Instead, you want to come back more. So come back more and pull more on the trigger. And you'll start seeing some white down on the feet, on the toes and such. Right? So notice how we get a little bit down low now. Now that you guys got that, I'll come in closer so you can see what's actually building up. And you can see that cool gray that we're getting. All right, so again, I'll come back and aim more towards the head where I want it to be brighter. Move left and right so I can get the gun and the shoulders. Pull back a little bit, a little bit more pressure on the trigger to get the thighs. Back a little bit, more pressure on the trigger to get the toes. All right, bingo. Look at that. Model's finished. He's, he's black and white TV. Done. Put it on the shelf. Right, but look at the cool effect you get. Your shadows are exactly where they need to fall because we never changed the elevation of the gun. Right, put it back in there. Now, rotate that model 180 degrees. So just make your mark exactly opposite your light so you can get the back and do the same thing. Same height away from the model. Same exact process. You just want a little bit less white from this angle. All right, so we're not going to oversaturate it too much. We'll pull back, pull on trigger a little bit more so we get the heels, back of the calf, arm, right top of the gun can be saturated a little bit bingo right so now that's pretty bright now we get much less on the back because of his posture right he's got that big backpack that's shading pretty much all of the lower body now we know we don't want that we want to have some value down there as dull as it may be so now i'm going to just angle straight towards him and just lightly feather in some of this white down in the shadows here back of the thigh up into the butt area, underneath the arms. I don't want anywhere to be just black. So I'm just going in and feathering a little bit of white to give that gray effect that I'm looking for in all of my shadow areas. I still have those nice shadows, but now I still pull those details out. If I just leave it black, I run the risk of losing some detail in there. And as I go back with my color, it just starts to kind of look bleh. So put a little bit of detail in there, give it a little bit of shadow. Now we're looking pretty good. Go back around to the front, do the same thing here. You want to get like up here in the abs where the angle of the armor prevents me from having the airbrush hit. I am going to tilt down because the abs have got that panel line there that separates each of them. So I still want to aim from the top, but I'm going to get in a little bit closer in the midsection and just feather that in there so that now those abs get a little bit of glow to them. And just keep working it until you build up a value that you're comfortable with. Right, I don't want it to be bright enough that the uh, paint that we put on top starts to show, to allow that brightness to show through. Right. Same thing over here on the ribs. Just a little bit of dusting. It almost acts like a dry brush, right? In the way that it only picks up the peaks if you hold the angle of the model right. Not getting a whole lot of paint built up in there. Just enough to get those details to pop a little bit. Not being pure darkness. Same thing over here. Just a little bit of feathering, and I'm basically, by feathering, I'm just riding that point of paint, no paint, on my airbrush. Right? There's a, a spot on every airbrush where the trigger is just about to give you paint, and that's where you want to be. And as it starts giving you paint, just keep moving the tip of the airbrush so you don't get too much paint in any one area. Underneath, so I get gray everywhere, and no area is still just 100% black primer if i can avoid it right sense really easy and now look at the values on my model this is where value where we talk about it all the time you take a look at this bam i've got all my shadows where they need to be i've got all my bright areas where they need to be and i haven't even gone back to pay attention to the bright that's all just from face down or uh you know the gun pointing down on the model right i've got grays fading out of those whites so there's no hard transitions anywhere I can keep amping this up, which I will do because I want a little bit of a metallic sheen. So once this dries, I'm going to go pump the whites up in some of these bright areas, and then I'll keep playing with it. 
But the whole thing is to use this angle to set it all up for you so that you can see how light would influence this three-dimensional object if it were outside in real space, right? Your airbrush is the light. So you just point it where you want your light to come from and you spray, right? But don't go heavy handed. You wanna do it lightly like I'm doing here. We don't really have any real saturated white on here. It's all just kind of shades of gray right now. We'll let that set for a minute while I gab and then we'll hit it with some brighter whites and you'll start to see it come even more alive. Didn't want to say, yeah, exactly, right? Hockey will ruin it. Well, any any professional sport or any heavy contact sport will bust your hands up for sure. I was a goaltender in ice hockey for most of my ice hockey career. I played for 22 years. Falco, you'd like to uh, try a standing desk out sometime? They're great. For me, it's great. Now, I know it doesn't work for everybody. Mine's adjustable. So like literally when I'm not on stream, I'll lower it down and I'll sit uh, and paint. But I find myself raising it back up for all my detail work because when I'm sitting, I just don't do detail the same. Drago, do you ever get into painting ruts where you either don't know what to do next or have no inspiration to put paint on a palette? Oh, yes, girl. Always. Always. And what do I recommend to people in those funks to do to get out of it? Um, it's going to be different for everybody. I, I always say find something else that you love as a hobby. Hopefully you've got something else that you do, whether you bake or whether you stitch, whether you run outside in the park, whether you take the dog for a walk. Those things, if there's another second hobby that you love find a way to move into that real quick. If, if your main hobby, like for me, my main hobby is this, what we see here. And, uh, and so for me, I'll go build some models. Uh, I'll do some bases. Um, you know, I'll work on, um, I don't, you know, whatever. I mean, now I have the store that is a hobby, so I can go work on the store. You know, I can do stuff like that, but typically I'll go build whatever's next in the pipeline for commissions. Um, you know, just put clean and put a model together. So I don't have to worry about color. I don't have to worry about painting. Um, you know, any of that. Uh, so it, it, I think it's different for everybody. Just, I would say, stay into those things that you find pleasure with. Don't feel like you're off doing something you don't want to do because then you start like resenting the painting even more. And I feel like that gets you into a rut. So just find something else that you enjoy. Play a game, you know, uh, take the models that you have painted or that you haven't painted even and play a game. Find a way to set up on the kitchen table and, and play your husband in a, in a 40K game, you know? Um, go down to your local store and play somebody in a game. Do that. I, I prefer things that keep me at least in the scope of the hobby because then I don't ever lose that, that interest at a, it never wanes to a point where it takes me days to get back to it, you know, because I have to be every day at least doing something in the hobby. And, uh, and so I, I don't want to go too far out. So if it's building army lists, uh, it's sometimes a, a great brain tease for you just go figure out how you can use the models you got in different ways with new rules especially with eighth edition coming out right now things like that ray silver spilling some super glue on one of your crappy synthetic brushes then soaking it in simple green and getting most of the bristles back gave me a version of my world's best brush yeah exactly man okay so you make your own would it be crazy to make a circular style paint rack where the paints were arranged according to the martian wheel layout just wondering um you could, if you did one that was like right now, I could technically do that, I guess, with my, my butt-in paint rack. It's not big enough to have 120 paints in a circle. It would make it, you'd have to make it square. The ones that I'm making aren't, they're more rectangular, so they go wider than tall. But if you took two of them and stacked them up, you could definitely do it, right? That's a good idea, actually. There'd be some spots that you use for like your blacks and whites and stuff around the corners where you didn't fill it. But yeah, that would... That might be a great way to do it and to keep to uh, you know keep track of it. And it's going to be very visually appealing, which a lot of times the way you space your paints out can affect the way you choose paints. If you just have them, you know, if you do this, what I've got here on the desk, right? If this is your paint collection, you're always going to make bad paint choices, right? Because they're never together. They're always just kind of whatever it is. Now with mine, you see like I got purples over here because I was using these purples. I got some blues that are nested together over here, greens. So there's... I won't say there's, I won't lie to you and say there's any order to this madness, but if you were to do it orderly, it might work. Um, you know, and if you use the butt ends of the paints and you don't keep, you know, similar colors together, if they're just, you know, throw paints back in as quick as you can so you get them off the desk, then it's not going to help you for your decision making process. But so I think that would be a great idea if you could, if you could do it, go for it. You still do that with a model that was predominantly black 502? Definitely, yes. One of the biggest issues with painting black is getting good value on it because a lot of times what you'll do is you'll keep adding grays. Um, one of the tutorials that we like to do around here is showing you how to do like black armor. 
right? So like on our uh, our Imperial Fist test model that we were doing a while back, right? I did the black kind of dull sheen, you know, it has a shine line on the armor. And this was done exactly like this. And then I used black to glaze back over it, right? So I go and I glaze over this so that you turn everything back into darker grays, but you still get these whites showing through. And then you can go back at the very end and pop highlights on it with white and light gray to get, you know, a good black, a dirty kind of a black armor, as opposed to taking black and then worrying about highlighting it with gray because it, there's that teetering point where it becomes gray with sh dark shadows on it, as opposed to black with highlights. And, you know, so that's why black is one of the single most uh, difficult paints to, or colors to paint in miniature. You grow tomatoes in garden, it resets the creativity meter. That's a hell of a deal right there. Yeah, whatever you've got. If you've got another hobby that you enjoy, then I think that's fantastic. All right, back to it. Let's, uh, this white has had a chance to set up. So now I'm going to get in, I'm gonna keep the model at the same angle, but now I'm gonna get in a little closer so that I can amp up the white on just the top of the head here. Right? I don't want the overspray. So I keep the same angle, but now I'm getting in close for very specific work. Top of the shoulder pad here. Brighten that up. Top of the gun here, even though I know the gun is going to be metallic, you know, we're gonna come in here and just give it some more brightness up here by the barrel. That forearm bit that's sticking out right there, right down in there. And now I want to get like the uh, the front of the armor coming down off the chin. So what I want to do here is get a steep angle coming down the front of his armored chest. Right, so I get that front plate right through the, the center section brighter. And notice how it's even picking up down here on the, the belly plate, I guess. Right, so now it gets brighter in that line. But I, I don't want to just come down like this because I don't want any of that brightness to get inside where that abdomen section is. Notice how that's now got a deeper value because it's inset. It should be shaded more. So pick your angles wisely as you spray. Think about every part of the model that might get overspray on it. Adjust your finger pressure on your airbrush and your angle of your airbrush accordingly so that you're not altering your shadows as you go, but you're still able to pick up the bright spots. Like I want to get brightness on the top of these um, thighs, I'm going to have to pick the model up now and I want to brighten up right here, but I don't want to brighten up anything around it. So I need to pick an angle that allows me to just get the top of these thigh plates like that and not shade or, or brighten anything down on the foot or the knee yet. I'm going to do that, but I don't want to do it all at once. They got to be at different levels. So I pick it like this, rotate the model a little bit to get this thigh over here. Right, and bang up that just a little bit. And now the thighs are a little brighter without messing up any of the rest of the abdominal section there. A little bit of brightness on these little flare outs right here by the top of the six pack. Right there to the side. And then a little bit on the top of the foot. And a little bit on the tops of all of these knee parts here. And so I'm gonna have to get another extreme angle. And I wanna just fire right down from the knee, right? And catch that center section right on that knee plate. See, like that. I'm only generating that by holding a very steep angle on the model and then basically firing right down that line very close so that I'm picking up again, lights coming from the top. So I'm still got that airbrush representing that light from the top. I have changed the direction a little bit, but because I have such close control, it's okay. Come over here and just do the same thing. Amp it up, go and raid right down the, feel like that, I get underside of that little knee plate just like we did over here i also pick up a little ghosting on those panels as they come down towards the foot exactly the way i need it but when you look at it from the front i still get those good shadow values up inside want a little bit on the top of this calf muscle and this is all just stuff that you're going to look at the model and say it needs to be a little bit brighter here a little bit brighter there so i just feather a little bit of white right on the top of that calf muscle uh over here 
Not so much, but I do want a little bit more gray, so I'm gonna aim at that calf muscle over here, but I'm not gonna turn it near as white. Just a spot in on that side because it's tucked up further underneath the body. This is the leg that's kind of sticking out. So again, you just kind of have to know your shading. Uh, this little strip coming off the top of the thigh needs a gradient on it. I'm gonna get in here, get really, really close, and then just feather that. So, same thing over here. The outside though. A little bit on the inside too. This top of this arm didn't get much from our above shot, so I'm going to go ahead and get it. And again, I would suggest to you guys here, I'm doing what I'm telling you, I'm, I'm do as I say, not as I do. Put your model back down, get the angle right, and then just aim at that arm, right? You can come in a little bit if you feel like you can't get it without overspraying the shoulder again, right? But use that same angle so you don't change your, your lighting angle. I know because I've got the spot on the base that I can pick it up and I know where to shoot my light, quote unquote, light from. Right? I'm gonna fade that a little bit as it goes over the edges of the shoulder pad and the arm here so that I get a good transition of the bright to the mid-tone to the dark on the backside. And again, on the backside, just give it a little dusting so that nothing is completely black. Brighten up these calves back here a little bit. And heels. Because they will poke out just a hair. Anything on this side. Steep angle again, so I'm only picking up the top edges of these things. Right. feet bingo good down low and let's get this backpack area up top again holding it at a fairly steep angle so i'm only getting brightness right there middle All right the further i get the wider the spray of color is i don't want a lot of spray on the sides i still want to keep that shadow on the collar and right, i just want the light spot right down the center of this backpack area All right like that Same on these sides. I'm basically here, I'm gonna shoot past the model at my finger, right? So notice how my finger gets some white paint on it, and I'm gonna bring it over so I just get the edge right there. Notice how the edge of that backpack right in there, I just catch that by shooting at my finger first. Same thing over here. Kind of sneak some down inside. Bingo. Feel like that probably gets us pretty good. A little bit more on these little things right above the knees here. These little panels right in set on the knee. I feel like I've got to get a little bit of a spot glow on those. So here I got to get in really close. I'm going to block you guys from being able to see, but I'll show you. Notice this part right here above the knee is too dark. I got to get in and brighten that up just a hair. I'm probably about a quarter of an inch off of the model. Like that. So now it's got that little bitty spot glow, but I don't shoot white down into the shadow. I want that panel line to still be visible. So this is all a control thing. This is all a, a no way to tell you other than to get good with your airbrush on this one. Know your airbrush, know the limitations, know when paint starts to come. And be able to just fire it in there real quick. You get... Just that little bit of glow on that spot above the knee. Most part, uh, top of this arm needs some help. Again, light from above, so I don't want to aim straight at it. I want to keep all this paneling because his arm is vertical right here. We're highlighting from the top. It'll get dull as it goes down towards the elbow. Why don't you donate $5 to the cause so, and maybe it'll make you feel better. Michael, welcome back, my friend. How the hell are you? 
$22 donation receipt from the Kyle Mojo. More on the front. Another Just one. want to pop these. Another one. You're a maniac, my friend. Exclamation point hype in chat. Michael, just joined our little family this week. Huge supporter already. Thank you so much, my friend. Joining us from South Africa. We literally reached the hobby out to all four corners of the world here, and it's spectacular the way you guys respond to the stuff that we do. Super, super stoked to have you guys be the best painting buddies on the planet, for one. Right. Here I'm just going in and spotting up a couple of areas here. I can get the front of the gun here on the bottom a little bit. Brighten that up, brighten this side up just a hair. On that cylinder. There you go. I feel like we got a good pre-highlight done on him. So I'm going to wash the brush out real quick. Again, we've got good highlights. Good shadows, good setup for all the painting that we're going to do. Right? Don't overdo it. Don't get to where there's too much. This looks like we're kind of oversaturating. Let me get the lights down so you can see exactly what I'm seeing. That's what I've got here on the palette. Right? So no oversaturation of white from top to bottom. Obviously, the shoulders and abdomen, everything from the waistline up is where you want to focus the bulk of your highlight. Because he's got metal armor, I also generally do the tops of the thighs, tops of the toes, and then again, that highlight on the knees and stuff. But notice how I still have retained all of my panel highlight, right? So all of my panel lines are still dark. That's one of the biggest keys. Get that angle, only saturate the panel lines where you know they would from the light, like the top here on this shoulder, right? There's a line there that no longer is really visible in the shoulder because light would be hitting that and blowing that shadow away. There wouldn't be a shadow there to see. So that's fine. Right? But everywhere else, we still get, because of the angle of our airbrush, if I just came in like this with the airbrush, I would lose all of the shadow in between like the striations of the armor on his uh, suit, his undersuit, right? In between the abdomen, like the six-pack that he's got going there, I would lose all those black lines if I came in and shot that like this. Hence the reason I shot down so that I retain. And I'm always looking at the model and saying, okay, uh, you know, how do these panels on the leg go? Why they overlap top to bottom. So I want to shoot from the top so that all of these dark spots stay. I don't get white paint in any of those panel lines if I can avoid it. I notice along here on the ankle, the same thing. I shot from up above so that this panel line would stay dark. That way I'm not ever really going back and washing panel lines or painting in panel lines again. I hate doing that. It drives me nuts. So if you can get good at, at getting your airbrush angle correct so that you can preserve, and especially on Infinity models, because they got panel lines galore. So they're probably the hardest models in the world to do this with. So maybe start with GW models, <laughs> you know, uh, that have higher details and, and less of that intricate overlay stuff. Uh, but as you get suited with it and you start to understand, then you can get in there and you can really get some amazing work done just with white paint. I mean, that's all it was, was very, very thin white paint. Always clean my brush up. I use, uh, for those of you that may not have seen us do any airbrushing on here before, I know that's Ogre, even though it doesn't know it's you. You typed your name wrong. That's on you, buddy. Thank you so much for the fiver. Uh, I use one of these eye washing, emergency eye washing bottles. You can get them at Amazon for like three bucks for three. Right? And uh, it allows you to put a pretty high pressure spray into the bowl uh, that'll help you wash away some of the, the paint in there. I try to keep the bowl super clean between color swaps and everything. Um, that will be the place that causes you the most problem with your airbrush. If you don't have the bowl of your brush clean, you'll always have a clog nozzle. Um, because you build up paint in the bowl and that paint does flake off and the flakes that come off from dried acrylic paint are not really fun to deal with when they get lodged in the nozzle of your airbrush. So a lot of people saying, you know, I've been painting and my airbrush, I just cleaned it and still I'm not getting any paint out. Do you know what the problem might be? And I'm like, yeah, I know what the problem might be. It's probably that you have a dirty airbrush cup. And they show me and they're like, yeah, it's hard to clean that. And like, yeah, it is, but you got to because every time you re-wet it with another paint, Particles of that dry paint are going to come off, right, and fall down into the body of the brush and get stuck in the nozzle. And they don't come out because they're too big. And they build up and build up and build up and they crust the inside of the nozzle to the point to where now the needle, no matter how far it pulls back out of the nozzle, is encrusted the whole way and no paint flows through. So, And that nozzle 
is the hardest thing in the world to, to clean if you need it quickly. If you just leave it and soak it overnight, it'll, it'll work a chant. But if you need like a color right now and you're really in the flow of painting, then it's a little harder. Rizzo, you're really out. Take it easy, man. And I'll run a couple of uh, cups of the water through it. I'm not using any airbrush cleaner because we're going to go ahead and airbrush another color. So I don't use cleaner until the end of the show, generally, unless I prime. If I'm priming, then I'll run cleaner through it immediately because the primer is very invasive and will start causing all sorts of problems instantaneously. Here, my goal is that whenever I backwash into the cup, I just don't want to see any white paint left. If that's all clear water up in there, then I'm fine. Which it is, so we're good. We're doing brown, so we don't really care if there's a little white in it anyway. Could you use a white airbrush primer for this step? You definitely can. I have before. Um, the uh, the difference between a primer is that the primer is a little bit thicker. Uh, that's just the way they make the primer with a larger polymer solution, so it's a little heavier duty. Um, so you got to be careful on the primer that you use. If you're using the Badger Steinal Res primers in the white, uh, you've seen me pre-highlight a lot of models with that. It works pretty well. You can thin it as well uh, since you're not needing it to be a primer coat. Uh, never be afraid to thin it. The biggest problem is that if you use the primer, the primer is going to be very, very thick right out of the, the cup. So it's going to give you a very dense white very quickly. So I tend to use the white primer on larger models, tanks, um, monstrous creatures, things where I need to have more coverage and I don't want to take the time to do like we did here where we're building up white layer after layer after layer because on a big model, it's just tons of time. So yeah, use the white primer on larger stuff, vehicles, monstrous creatures, things like that. Oh, show. And then white paint for smaller stuff where you want to still get that good transition from gray to white. You know, I don't want everything to just immediately look white. If I used a white primer on a small model like this, I'd lose a lot of that transition to gray that you see. I mean, you could, this is a great method for doing like, you know, if you're painting some miniature for a statue, right? You do this process and then you go back with a gray and you dry brush over it to give it some texture and you're done. I mean, like legit, you could be done because it just looks like it's made out of stone as it sits. It's Vin. Was somebody trying to ask a question, Ray? Yeah, definitely. If you're trying to get my attention in chat, please use at Gaming so that I will see. I don't want to ignore anybody, but there's so much going on in chat. A lot of times I miss it. I miss it. But I am definitely not trying to ignore anybody. It's Vin. Says, sorry for the random question. If you were doing prep on something like a tank, what would you do use to fill? You're doing prep on an Iron Man helm and you need to fill behind an ear. Um, depends on how big the crack is, it's Vin. I mean, are we talking about something that's just like a, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a joining line for a panel? If it's something small that has a solid surface beneath it, then I use um, Hobby Light Filler. It's very, very lightweight, hence the name. Um, and it's like, a, I mean, it, it's almost, I mean, it's crazy. It's like a powdery thing, right? It's almost like a, like wallboard filler, wall filler, uh, before they make it into a paste, right? Because this isn't pasty at all. It's like a powder, but it's, uh, you can cram it down into holes. The problem is if it's, if you've got a, like a, you say like an Iron Man mask, if you've got an Iron Man mask that doesn't have a layer behind it, so you've just got two pieces of plastic coming together and they have a gap in them, then you're going to need something that's a little more solid, like a two-part epoxy putty, like a green stuff, we call it. Uh, I use epoxy sculpt. It's A-P-O-X-I-E, epoxy sculpt. Um, it's a two-part hardener and, and uh, putty that you mix together and uh, it turns white. Well, it, one of them is white, one of them is gray. You mix them together until it's all white. Um, and then you spread it in there more like sculpting with a putty because if you don't have a, something underneath to keep that Hobby Light stuff won't work, it'll fall right through the hole. Uh, you need to be able to pack it into a joint that has you know a closure at the back that's not just a wide open hole. But a two-part epoxy putty for anything that you're doing in modeling like this is a is a, a must-have for filling and stuff. Michael, you did get one booty going. You're the man. Thank you. Uh, you don't need to ply the neck beards at the LGS with beers to get them to share their painting techniques. Twitch, Twitch eliminated that grins. <laughs> Wait a minute. You don't have to buy me beer to get you to teach you stuff? Damn it. 
how exactly to mix your own titanium white paint uh, if you wanted to make your own bottle of it, Technocat. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, blah, 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 blah. Um, hmm. Should we just make some real quick? I could make more. You want to just do that real quick? All right. So let's let's just mix some paint real quick. It doesn't take long. And I think I've got a cup here that I can do it with. And another acid brush real quick. I'm going to save the other acid brush, did I not? Did I throw it away? I did, dang it. All right. So I use these little mixing cups. Uh, you can use whatever. You can mix it in... Uh, um, in the bottle, I guess, if you really wanted to. But the the most important part about mixing a paint from paste, uh, like artist acrylics, to usable liquid paint is to make sure that you really get the first step with the uh, acrylic medium, the airbrush medium. You get that mix solid. Because if, if it's not saturated throughout the solution, then you're you're going to wind up with it separating. And that's why sometimes you'll see paints like from GW, they'll be hard down on the bottom, wet up at the top. That's the medium pulling apart from the pigmentation. Um, the, the pastes aren't quite that bad, but they can be if you don't get this mixed. So that's why I don't mix it in the bottle. That's why I don't just squirt paint and then medium in here and then just shake it. Because that doesn't give me a solid mix that I feel comfortable with. Um, so... What I want to do is, to the best of my ability, mix these uh, one to one. So I use these graded uh, cups. You know, you can see here that it's like in milliliters or teaspoons or whatever the hell you get. Fluid ounces is generally what I use. So let's do a quarter of a fluid ounce of paint. Right. So I just want to get about yay. Add it down. You just want it to level, so just smack it on the table so that the paste kind of levels out. You never, I'm never really worried about it. So that's more like an uh, eighth of a fluid ounce, maybe. Something like that. Not perfect science here. Uh, then I take my golden airbrush medium. Uh, you can use Liquitex airbrush mediums. Uh, the Vallejo stuff doesn't come in quantities big enough to really want to use it. So I'd say like the, the golden and the Liquitex and the stuff you find at the art store are better because you can buy larger amounts of it all. all right? And then uh, give it a good shake. And then I just want to add this pretty much one to one. So we're going to float this paint here till I get to a little over that. Bingo. So now I've got a total of about a quarter of a fluid ounce. I had an eighth of a fluid ounce of paint. And now I got a quarter of a fluid ounce once I added in the uh, airbrush medium. Right. And so all the airbrush medium is, is, li is literally like a clear paint. It already has the polymer in it and everything. Um, and then I just mix it together. I use an acid brush. You don't have to. I use the acid brush for mixing two-part epoxies. The two-part epoxies are a pain in the ass. And will destroy your normal brushes. I use the acid brush here just because it's the largest thing I have that I don't care about. I have a larger brush, but for mixing, it is going to put a bunch of paint up in the ferrule. So I would, say, get a, a stick or something. And you just want to spend a lot of time in this stage mixing it up. Scrape the stuff off the walls. Get it back down into the cup. Okay. If you've got a paint mixer, more power to you. I don't have anything like that, like motorized tools for this. I do it just the old caveman way. We just bang paint together in the, in the cup. But this is the part where I don't feel like shaking it. Gives me the peace of mind of seeing it here and making sure that there's a very even, pasty kind of consistency to it. And what I'm looking for at this stage is kind of a cool whip consistency if that makes sense like a heavy cream rancid goat piss with a sub four months in a row thank you my friend welcome back All right so i'm looking for like a very heavy cream it's kind of airy right but it doesn't just drip off the brush right notice that it doesn't drip from gravity if i shake it it's not going to drip off right kind of bubbly on there you can as you hit it against the wall it peaks like egg whites whipped or something like that right you guys doing that that's the consistency you're looking for. I feel like that's pretty good. Scrape all that off. Now we put a little bit of water in there. And how much you need at this point really just depends on how you want to paint with this. Uh, I paint very, very thin. So for me, I'm looking for a paint consistency that is thick enough to pill up but uh again not enough to just drip from gravity right 
So see that drop of paint on there? It's not just going to come off until I shake. Right? If you water it down too much, you pick the brush up and you just get drip, 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 then you're going to need to add more paint. Because there's really not a value to that unless you were making a paint that you were strictly going to use for airbrushing. Maybe then, but probably still too thin to work with. I like to have a paint that's kind of in the middle. I can still brush paint with this very well. But I can also thin it down very quick like we just did and airbrush it without getting it sputtering. You notice how we didn't get any sputtering with this white as we painted this pre-highlight. Whereas all of the Army Painter, Vallejo, Scale 75, all their whites are horrible in general. I hate them all. And, uh, and they sputter and they're pains in the ass. So, so now you've basically, for lack of a better mathematical way to tell you, you've basically put 50% uh, airbrush medium to paint for your first solution. And then you take that and you mix anywhere from 25%. I wouldn't go 50% water to that solution. I'd start with like 25%. So you've got your, your paint medium mix and then you add water to that. So you probably want 75-25% paint and medium to water. That's what I'm doing here, I feel. And then uh, I'm gonna take the top off of this bad boy. These are the bottles that we sell over on slowfusegaming.com. So you can get the bottle with the glass agitators. They use soda glass agitators that are fully chemical proof. Um, and they, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. And then the pouring is always the hardest part. Oh, there's also hairs from my, look at that. So the pouring is the hardest part. Let's see if we can do this again. Make it work. Oh. Oh, too thick. I can tell you already, we're too thick. Because it is not pouring correctly. So I'm going to add a little bit more water. A little bit thinner. Hello. Are you joining us? It's a gin sighting, guys. Let's see if we can get this to not become a disaster with that thick paint. I'm gonna have to wipe it off the top of the wall. There we go also an air bubble in there that was keeping it from going down so a little bit better this time oh failing miserably at getting it actually into the bottle this time around I feel like I feel like we're gonna use the trick somebody said the other day and squeeze the bottle so that as I pour it I can release the bottle. That's working. Hang on, I'll turn your mic on in just a second. I got my hands full. He's talking. Nobody's listening. What I'm doing here is basically squeezing and then releasing. Oh, except the air bubble. You really need to go get like a miniature funnel. That would make this a lot easier. Yes. No. What? <laughs> Why are you always judging me? Why are you judging me? Stop judging me. Almost full, so this is getting a little precarious because the bottle's damn near full of paint now. We've done this twice in a week. Just a graduated cup. There we go. That's what I mixed it in. No, the mixing balls keep it mixed after you've got it in the bottle. Uh, if you mix it in the bottle, it doesn't, I never feel like you get a solid mix at the first crucial stage, which is where you're putting the medium in the paint. So I always mix it in an outside cup. I just can't find my damn, I have a little bitty funnel and I don't know where it is. Why don't you it has gone away, gone the way of the dodo. Apophis, thank you so much. I will turn Jen up now. There she is. 
All right, so we got a little messy with our pour. No harm, no foul. Buy yourself a funnel. You can use a piece of paper if you're smart. I'm not smart, so. Dollar donation received from Apophias underscore UK. Apophias? Is that what she said? <laughs> Apophias. Put an extra syllable You in guys, I've been mispronouncing from. all your names for years now. Apophias. According to the, according to the bot lady. <laughs> all right. And then it's got the agitators in it, so then you can continue to mix it up. Although now we have a really, really full bottle, which is good. It's that simple. It's really just finding the mix <laughs> that you like uh, and scaling it for the use. Like I said, I want the paint when it uh, comes out to be... Oh, it does have two eyes. Hard to see. What's that? Apophis has two eyes in it. Maybe it is a pop. A pop ice? Apophias. Maybe so. All right. So again, <laughs> you just want to be able to have it be like paint out of the bottle for all your other stuff, right? Mm. That the thickness that we mix it, we want it to not drip continuously from gravity when we put it on the palette, right? But to still be smooth enough that, you know, as we go and add water to it, that we can pull a tail out and we can paint with it very easily, glaze with it, everything. So this, I know it's white on white paper, so that's hard for you guys to see. Right, but I can pull a tail out. It doesn't glob onto the brush, right? It's not, I'm not pulling the whole chunky drop along with it, right? Which is a big problem if you don't put enough medium in it. So you just want to make sure that that's the consistency you get at the end, right? Enough to where your brush just intrudes on the paint like it would any other paint. Bingo. And titanium white, literally go buy it. Go do what we just showed you. You'll get five bajillion bottles out of it and you'll never buy white miniature paint again and you'll, your life will be a lot easier. You'll use this for mixing highlights. You'll use it for glazing. You'll use it for airbrushing. You'll use it for everything. You now have a white that is uh, basically the best white that you'll ever have. Titanium white, artist's acrylic. Medium body, do not buy heavy body acrylics, okay? Medium body if you can get it. Heavy body, the pigmentation size is just a little too large, so it might give you problems in your airbrush. That's going to be dependent on what paint you buy. If you bought like a heavy body Winsor Newton, you could probably do it okay. Uh, but if you bought a cheap paint like I do, buy the medium stuff. Don't buy the heavy body stuff. It will drip down the stick. I'm not that smart, though. <laughs> I have super dexterous hands, JP. Doesn't take much dicks. I got the drip into the bottle. My aim was very good. Screw you guys. <laughs> Screw you guys. I think you did a nice job. I gotta have one thing I'm bad at, right? And I think we've all learned today, it's pouring paint into paint bottles. Although the last time we did it, I didn't even spill any. Mm hmm? Yeah, logistics. Yeah, you can use the Windsor Newton acrylic medium for sure. All the all the airbrush medium is is a thinner version of standard acrylic medium. It has a uh, uh, it's got the same drying retarders in it that a standard medium does. The polymer, I don't believe the polymer bonding is any different other than it's thinner overall. So I guess the poly, the, the bonds are stretched a little bit in the solution, but um, yeah. Same thing. You're just going to have to add more water if you use a regular uh, acrylic medium because it's going to be thicker out of the get-go. So if you mix paint with acrylic medium, you'll have a thicker solution. You'll need to add more water to it to have it be more like, you know, a, a normal paint that we're used to using. Or just remember every time you use it, you got to thin it down more on the brush. Right? A funnel is just one more thing to clean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Crank it on with a sledgehammer. Exactly, Grins. Drac, what's happening, man? <laughs> if you wanted the Morats to have white Not armor, what else would you need to do, asked Jagera. Uh, if you wanted white, basically what you would do is I would probably go up a little bit higher in my scaling of white here because remember, nothing's really bright white on this model right now. Right? It's all like just light gray at its brightest point because we're going to be doing browns over it. And so I don't have any white. So I would keep scaling the white up like on the head. I would go to bright white on all of the peak spots. I would do bright white to where it's just kind of a you know, uh, uh, bigger than a glow, uh, but still give my transition. I'd probably just push this shade transition down to maybe this last uh, pokey outy thing on the on the parts that I wanted white. You basically just want to saturate more white, but give it that shadow. And then you basically go on at the end and glaze more white on it to brighten it up where you need to, glaze dirt back on it, things like that. Um, trying to think of what we've done with white lately. Nothing. We did a towel uh, commander 
suit, one of the crisis suits in, in white for a uh, one-on-one -on -one tutorial with one of our clients that I showed on stream a while back. But other than that, I haven't painted a lot of white armor. I have to do that coming up. I have to find something that we want to paint uh, actual white on. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to airbrush the brown. So let's start in. Let's go through all the rest of these questions first. Um, My week has been great, Ray. Techno Thank cat. you for asking. I feel just, oh, yeah, we already did that. The Russian judge took off for spillage. 8.4 <laughs> is not a good score. Is not 10. Stealing pen, pens without getting shanked. I'm good at that. I'm good at that. She has not shanked me yet. Okay. But I don't steal her pens. I have a pen right here. She so. steals my pens. You know. have believed the devil. Is, I think this is one of your pens, not, not my pen. The devil has convinced <laughs> you people of things. <laughs> Jen should be the one telling you what I'm bad at. Hey, sh <laughs> You're not allowed to talk over I there, woman. I am not bad at anything. Last time I created Cold Fusion and no one was watching, you did it perfectly. But now that people are looking, I don't know if I can do it. That's all I heard. Hey, JP Gray, uh, if you go back to last week's VODs, you'll see me pour the paint. Bitches! <laughs> I did that shit live on film. <laughs> didn't spill a drop. Chuck Whiffin uh hit the bathroom, but didn't want to run into the same thing with the giveaway yesterday. You going to do the giveaway soon? Yeah, let's... Uh... <laughs> do that right now. Yeah, let's do it right now. Chuck, are you still here? Or are you in the bathroom? <laughs> he just typed that, so I think... We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do a giveaway. <laughs> so everybody that's in here, you got a couple more seconds to enter exclamation point booty, right? To get I'll in just, on this giveaway. I'll just start buying only pens that are like pink and purple, and then he won't take them. <laughs> all right, we'll do a giveaway, and then we'll start, we'll start spraying some brown on this guy. That doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> Where'd our wheel go? <laughs> you don't start getting raunchy until I get here. What? Talking about balls and shaft and bitches, calling people bitches. Excuse me? Ray Silver said that it's only when I'm here. What? The rest of the time it's like a PG movie. What? <laughs> I'm a bad influence, I guess. What? All right, there we go. There's the wheel it was hiding. I don't know what was going on. Being shy. Being shy. All right, we got one winner coming out of you. Did, you, did I give you the drum yes, thing back? Yes, I have it in my Okie hand. dokie. I'm ready. Are you ready? All right, is everybody in here? We went up to 70 in by 70. Slackers. Freaking slackers. You're late. You're not going to get a chance. All right, pick a winner. Get down with the crowd. Rancid, Rancid goat, goat piss. He's offline. Line. Again. Last night we had a problem because offline, oh, but Rancid it. was just here. Dirty little thing. Rancid. <laughs> Somebody I'm going to give him he extra time. Online. It's Vin. Thank you for the follow. Welcome. Rancid. I'm going to give... Well, but last night, <laughs> our winner was technically offline, but was here. And we we screwed the pooch on that, that one. Happened. So Gray, thank, thank you so you. much for the follow. Welcome, my friends. What's what happened? Then? Rancid. Because Twitch has screwed up so much here in, oh. in the past that uh, it was setting people to gone if they were watching on their TV browser oh. because the TV browser was what was being used last night. So I mm -hmm. want to give everybody extra time to speak okay. up because Rancid okay. Goat Piss just resubbed. Like literally five minutes ago, oh, wow. Rancid Appreciate resubbed. $5 so. Michael, with the 35 bucks, making another Thank spin. You. Are you kidding me? Awesome. Michael, I don't know what to do with you, my friend. The support is unreal. Thank you very much. We got two giveaways to do. But remember, you got to be here for these. And Rancid Goat Piss, it's, all, it's calling you offline. Are you here? Oh, no. <laughs> Rancid, are you here? Donation received from Mikhail Modi. Another one. Another one. Rancid. All right, we got to redraw. We've given... Ample time. Do Gotta do it. All right. So, uh, in place of Rancid, we have... Gnozel! Congratulations. Gnozel is here. Like, don't go nowhere. Don't go nowhere. There you go. Woot. <laughs> All right. And uh, second, last but not least... Max 27. Congrats to Max and the Gnozel. All right. 
That's it. Nobody's going to walk in on us right as we're spinning and say, I'm here, though. <laughs> Not going to happen tonight. We fixed that last night. All right. Okay. I got to stretch. Got to do some toe touches. <laughs> oh, God. Uh -oh. My toes are so far away. Ugh. Papa's re like refresh, try refreshing. Have or... you noticed that that the older you get, the further your feet get away from your hands? Oh, mine are so far away. It's really weird, right? <laughs> Might have been far away forever though. Like I didn't realize my legs got longer as I got older. That's a thing that happens. I gotta stretch. <laughs> oh, here we go, one more time. Oh. Okay, work the hammies out. Oh. 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 I think I've been pulling things lately, doing all this awkward man stare without some pre warm up. <laughs> yep, oh. Chuck, go poop. Ugh. All right. Who's up first? Deganozel. Ganozel. Who said his streak of not winning is broken? Well, I'm sorry to have to do that to you, my friend. <laughs> but that's how we are around here. And along <laughs> with your win, you get to participate in helping the world become a little more awkward. Ganozel, get close. I stretched and everything. <laughs> I'm ready for you. <laughs> you see it? I winked with the right eye today. Oh! I'm Changing not good things with the right up eye. a bit. It takes a lot of. It, I think it's the stretching. Yeah. I think yeah. it's the stretch. Oh, it works! It works! It's so beautiful. Ganoza, what do you win? <laughs> The Marines! Mark Some Mark III Marines, Marines, my friend. Congratulations, Gnozel. Mark III Marines from the burning of Prospero. Fantastic. Max! Max, are you ready? <laughs> Ray Silver said full screen for Max. He needs it for the lotion usage. Really? I thought I that was know. Butters. <laughs> I thought it was Butters. <laughs> Does Max say he uses lotion too? <laughs> I mean, we can do this. <laughs> We can we can make this happen, right? I think we can do that. <laughs> Give me that awkward man stare. Now pout a little. Yeah, now you're a tiger. Rawr. Let me see that wing. Rawr. Now you're a sad puppy. <laughs> Be a sad puppy. <laughs> that was all DVD. <laughs> I just like I like I, I just went. narrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's an ambient winker. <laughs> I can't do it. Even with the stretching, I can't do it. I can't do it. All right, Max, what do you get? What does he win? Give him things. Give him all the things. Oh, you should get some awkward man stair lotion for the store. AMS that lotion? That would be funny. I think we ought to have that made. I bet there's a company that would I'm make me sure some man lotion. I'm sure we could get some lotion made. Bet it would happen. Wrath of Kings oh, yeah, Nasir starter cool. set. Congratulations. Congratulations to Wrath of Kings again, finally, for crying out loud. Everybody's getting close to that Malifaux Queen's return set. That's an amazing set for Malifaux, by the way. All right, congratulations, and thank you guys so much for the support that allows us to do this. Yeah, a lot of giveaways this week. A lot of great stuff everyone. up on the wheel. Gouda, gouda. Raffle is still going on, so uh, do not fret. If you did not win anything, there might be more chances tonight. You never know. And if you we do, do not, our, oh, well, Psychotic Jester already did it for me, but if you have not already uh, filled out the form with your address, please do that if you want. Please do. Please. Uh, need to exit the rest of the water out of my <laughs> airbrush. <laughs> Let's paint some brown. <laughs> Max said he made his wife look away. Duh, duh. Yeah, that was probably <laughs> the best, best choice you've made all day, Max. <laughs> Some things you just can't let. I usually preface everything with make the family go to the other room, but I forgot tonight. So good on you. Good on you. You prevented what could have been a very <laughs> serious injury tonight. Thank you for that community service. <laughs> Michael, you're holding out for next time. It tends to come in waves around here. Assassin, you're here. Free subs do not change the ticker. No, only, only in brand new subs you. right now. We just did it, Desire Death. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
We have raffles? <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Desire being, who was it that used to do that all the time? Uh, we, have, um, we haven't seen him in forever. Where is he? Why did I just draw a blank? Chuck would have been <laughs> different. I love it. I can poop now. Yeah. <laughs> forced induction. Yep, That's it was forced. It was, it was, <laughs> like, it was forced. Ah, I could see the Forced name, used to come in always like right right after we did a giveaway. No, he was here the whole time. He just was being silly, I think. Awkward man stare lotion incoming. Best I idea of ever. Happen. All right. And it just has your face on it, like the close up on your eyes. Oak brown is what we're going for. It's a good dark brown, but it's not uh, it's not horribly dark. So it's going to accent our shadows, but not going to be to the point where, you know, it, it still looks black, right? It's going to tint the black pretty well. Uh, I use from Vallejo chocolate brown would be very similar to the oak brown. Um, I'm going to put a couple drops yes. of oak brown. Notice what, how what every Ray time... Said. Every time I mix my paints, it's pretty much the same. Notice how there's no paint really in the cup. It's all down in the body of the brush. That's o the only amount of paint that I put in my airbrush. Uh, the raw paint sits down here in the body of the brush. I don't really ever load up enough to be in the cup. And that's how I, that's my measurement device that I've always used is that it's enough paint if it just comes up to like the, the bottom of the neck or the gravity cup attaches. Then when I add in the way that I tell, cause you know, my super scientific measuring methods, uh, I come in with flow improver and I float flow improver on it to where it's just up to the bottom of the cup. All right, so paint down in the in the body, flow improver up to the body of the cup, just out of, outside the neck of the cup. Right, so the whole thing is probably I always like to say it's seventy percent flow improver, thirty percent paint, something like that. All right, then I take the best brush in the world. Don't get jealous. You uh, guys can't have one. LT said you need to check whip quickly before you get back to paint. Oops. Before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I probably have hey, enough time Anthony. to look at some whip before we spray this brown. Maybe. Question mark. And don't burn your paint. Yeah, let's paint this brown first, and then we'll take a look at whip after I clean and go to switch colors. All right. Bingo. All right. Try to keep your cup as clean as possible, just so it makes it easier for the actual cleaning part. Sure, I don't have my needle gummed up. I don't feel like it is, but there might be a little bit of grime on it. Perfect. <laughs> he said it's the, he said just pull up the first one. It's important. It's important? <laughs> I feel like this is a joke, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I feel like this is a gotcha bitch that I'm about Wait, to get you're got. You're gonna do it right now? I'm gonna do it right now. <laughs> I'm gonna do it right now. It's the first pull one up he the says. First one before we lose too many people from earlier, he said, okay. That's the what do you mean? Lose too many people from earlier? I don't know. This one? Oh my God. Is it this? What is it? Everyone who attended Slow Fuse's color theory lessons on 615 <laughs> should download this certificate and post it prominently in your hobby area. <laughs> yes, challenge accepted. Everybody Does needs to go Dr. there. Dr. Jason Craze. And what's the last one? Bombshell is it? color theory. Bombsnail color Bomb theory. Bombsnail color theory. And uh, from. <laughs> I want to know what your title was next there. To certify that Blank has successfully completed Bomb Snail Color Theory 101 on 615 from Dr. Jason Craze, fainting doctor. P faint fainting, fainting, fainting doctor. What is the H for? <laughs> is that a typo? Fainting? You already have a typo <laughs> in it? That makes it even better, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so everybody can print that off with the, the spell check <laughs> off of it and everything and go. So now I expect to see, I want, you know what I want? The challenge has been set. Yes. Thank you so much for the creation of the certificate. I need photos of everybody's paint lab with that certificate if you were here Just for our color theory you teachings it earlier. Up. You can put a little mortarboard on if you have one. <laughs> Hold up your certificate. Yep, there you go. Yeah, you're a graduate. There you go. <laughs> all right. So in with the brown, we're just going to go over all the armor panel armor panels, which is pretty much the whole model, right? Oh, we're just gonna go so the pH is, was on purpose. It's supposed to be like PhD. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> Gun stuff has an extra frame, so he said I'll frame it. <laughs> Done deal, right? Make it happen. All right, we're running our paint very, very thin. You can see that like a, it was a dark brown, but what's coming out is more of a tan, right? And it'll only be the dark brown in the shadows, which is exactly what you're going for. It's the whole reason we do that pre-highlight. 
<laughs> so you want to run your paint more air than paint don't oversaturate any area with paint Chuck, otherwise you'll build up too much color and you'll lose your highlight is the critical issue more critical than your need to go to the bathroom what <laughs> Chuck said, why did this happen? I need to go to the bathroom, but a critical issue happened and I need to stay here and fix it. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I guess it's the critical Windows issue. shit the bed, like, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, so notice how we've got our dark to light transitions holding up underneath our brown because we're running very, very thin. Hey! Shamrock Goblin! Shamrock Goblin! Holy hell, what a great name. We've got the best names coming online today. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome, my friend. <laughs> Has anybody out there noticed that I have gotten much better with the whole, like, you know, welcoming of followers? It's no longer, like, the gender-specific thing. Like, I'm like, welcome, my friend, because oh, everybody can be my friend. Is anybody noticing that's that? That's right. Like, I feel like I'm doing pretty good, good with job. that. I used to be like, hey, man, thanks for the follow. And I'm like, wait a minute. We got so many women here. You're not <laughs> men. That is awkward. We're all about awkward here, but I've been like, thank you, friend. Plus, you're all my friends, so I feel like that's a much better realization of that whole thing. <laughs> the PG movie crap I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh, Evis, Evis wants to know what about those that don't have it? Uh, everybody, everybody has one. Gender. Whether you like your gender or not is up to you, yeah. but everybody's but everybody got one. Now, one. you may be able to pick it and all that. I ain't going to get into a political conversation, <laughs> but you, trust me, you got one. <laughs> what you do with it is up to you, and I ain't going to fault you for it, but you do you. But yeah, you are gender non-specific. When you, when you greet people, you're gender non-specific. That's my goal. Yes. <laughs> Dog and Ezel said, I'm not your friend, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I'm not your friend, pal. <laughs> not your pal, buddy. Who are you calling buddy, pal? <laughs> Uh, I'd like once to know if you're spraying the same-ish amount of brown all over the model or if you're concentrating it somewhere. Uh, right now, it's just for coverage. Good question. Um, right now, it's all going to be primarily the same. I'm not really focusing on any areas as it is. I just want to get coverage for all the areas that I know are going to be brown. So as I'm spraying, I'm thinking more about the model and like, okay, what is this armor panel? What is it intended to do? Do I want this brown? Do I care about overspray on this? You know, things like that. So that's the goal right now. And then we'll go back and focus on like the shadows mainly with our, our shade color like this, right? Is going to be focusing on the darker spots. But notice how our pre-highlight, you see all the work that we did with that white happening right in front of your face, okay? So everything that we've done here looks like we've got more colors of brown on than we really do. You've got lights, you've got shaded colors, it looks like, you know, a lot of work with the color has already been done, but it's not. It's the way the whites and those grays, right, the thin whites are showing up through this thin layer of brown that we're throwing down on the model right now. So that's why we spent all that time doing that, telling you about how to get your shadows to look good on there. You know, the ankles and the, the heel plates and everything are standing out brighter, top of the backpack, top of the shoulder. You still get all that transition. But the key to getting this to work for you oh. is to drive those pre-highlights bright enough Right? Don't let them just be in mid-tone grays. Drive them up almost to white, if not white. White's fine. And then run your paint through your airbrush super thin, like a glaze. Um, if you, I mean, you'll know instantly if you've got too thick a paint in the airbrush because that pre-highlight would go away entirely. You wouldn't get this transition on the shoulder pad like we've got. Right? Where we go from bright to dark across the top of the shoulder pad. All these areas are looking good. I'm digging it. And what we'll <laughs> do now is with the same paint, 
<laughs> start focusing on the darker shaded areas. I'm going to go in and start layering up in more of the dark areas. Because remember, we've got other colors that will be coming into the light areas. I'm not as concerned with those. But I want my shadows to make sure that I get a really good crisp brown. Assassin said some cultures have three, five, even seven genders. Bath and bang, bath and bang. I don't know what that means. But if you're human, there are only two. Because science. Well, see, humans can make whatever happen happen that they want to happen. And collectively, if they want to say there's 15 different genders, then no, guess no, what? There's 15 no, no, different no, genders. Science. There's only two. What if in someone's native language or native tongue, friend translates to, I'll defile your mother's corpse? Well, then I hope fewer <laughs> of those people join the uh, stream than not, because that would be a little awkward, a little yeah. bit, that would push a little past the regular awkwardness <laughs> that I'm going for here into like just straight on like death threats in my mail probably, and that's not what we do this for. Just saying. We're not here to offend anybody's mothers. <laughs> We're just here to paint little men. Wait, what? I'm going to show her you run it, Fuse. Now, on the helmet, I don't know if I want the crest of the helmet to be brown as well. I feel like maybe so. The faceplate on the helmet is going to be red. Wow. So we're going to do red face, uh, different colored mandibles coming off of it, maybe darker red. But then these flaps up across the back of the net, do we want to do those in brown as well? Or do we want to add a different color on there? I wonder, I wonder. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> they could be like white. We could do that back panel in white and then the face in red to just have some good color separation. I like that idea. Let's do them in white. That'll be a very stark way for the red to not sit right up against the brown. We'll do this back panel with white. Wish I'd have thought of that earlier. I would have uh, hit it with the airbrush a little bit brighter. Okay. I'm feeling good about this. We've got good shadows where we need them. Browns are bright where we need them. I'm liking it. Our pre-highlight is doing its work. All right. Next cooler. I think. Make sure we are looking at everything. I want to make sure we got good coverage up underneath. Oh, there's a panel that doesn't have any. There. Probably want to get these hip plates as small as they are, but let's get those brown as well. Can't really see. Sorry. Trying to get these, uh, he's got like this girdle looking thing here that I want to make sure has got enough brown on these panels to separate it out a little bit. That area. This looks pretty good. Beavis <laughs> wants to know, would you get a tattoo of a skull on your face if someone donated $5 million? Yes. And then in parentheses, only hypo hypothetical, not saying I would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. $5 million will we'll get a skull right on my face. We could have made some big assumptions there. <laughs> I, ain't a, I, ain't, I ain't too proud. And I like tattoos, so I could probably find a very creative way to have a skull on my face. Yeah, I think it doesn't, we haven't specified the size. If it says a tattoo of a skull, it could be a microscopic skull. Right here. Yep. Right between my eyes. Five million bucks, I'm fine with that. Oh, are we are we talking about like my whole face? There's a dude Doesn't that has his whole that. face. He's an actor. Just said, would you get a tattoo of a skull on your face? No, I know, but like the whole face. There's that kid that actually has that. I think, I think they had him play in a couple of movies that I've seen. Right, bad movies. He's not an actor, but he was in the movie just because of the way he looked. Oh, whole face. Oh well. What about that? Five million dollars only gets us so far in life. That's yeah, true. <laughs> Might have to increase that number a little bit. It's true, the inner nostril is part of your face. It could be a place for it. 
Uh oh, now we've get we have to get into the technical definition <laughs> of face. Your whole face. Well, the 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 question asker specified whole face. So I've been called butt face before, so what if I got it tattooed on my butt cheeks? <laughs> I don't think I really want my whole face tattooed. That would hurt, number one. Yeah. All right. Since we're running in the, the realm of brown still, I'm not gonna run, you know, a very thorough cleaning, but I just wanna make sure that as I'm spraying water out, I'm not getting a whole lot of pigment. And again, just make sure that you clean your cup every time. Every Between every paint change, you ought to see the stainless lining of the cup and no paint. That's Get used to that. Make that your mantra as far as painting goes with an airbrush, and you'll be very, very happy with the way your airbrush performs over the years. A model named Rich Genist. I Rich see, Genist? I is that it? Is? He's not a model, guy. JP. He's just a dude who made <sighs> bad life choices and now can be in, like, Mad Max movies. Elvis, what inspired tattoos? What inspired my tattoos? <laughs> Pixel cats, exactly. <laughs> when you make a wish to Gina, you need to be very specific when you ask hypothetical questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, but very specific <laughs> about it. Uh, are you spray? Yeah, we already answered that. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you're asking what inspired my tattoos, most of my tattoos are uh, very kind of uh, Eastern philosophical inspired tattoos that have to do with uh, tenacity and wisdom. That's what the hands are. Uh, tenacity from the snake uh, that's on my hand and wisdom because this is a, a Tibetan ancestral skull. So the wisdom of those that came before you kind of a thing uh, and the tenacity. Uh, it's not a Pokemon symbol. No, everybody thinks spots. that's a Pokemon ball. <laughs> um, we were driving down the street and one some young girl in a car was like, I love your Pokemon tattoo. And I was like, great, thanks. And then I started <laughs> looking. I was like, what the fuck looks like a, oh, looks like a Pokeball. Um, so it's, yeah, it's all about uh, wisdom and tenacity. The snake is also a symbol for wisdom. So, you know, and the skull being kind of a, you know, a, our, our brains wrap around it being kind of a, an evil symbol, even though it's not, right? So they kind of, everything kind of balances out. Uh, there's the the gods of the winds. So the uh, the dragon and the turtle are the north and the east. The tiger and the phoenix that I have on my other arm are the south and the west. So just stuff like that. And then on my hands it says slow burn. Uh, my great grandmother, I got the uh, the luck of being able to uh, uh, grow up with my great grandmother in my life, and she lived till she was 104. She was oh, born wow. in 1900, and uh, had seen pretty much everything that you know. A human that you could talk to had seen right she'd seen great wars world war one world war two uh she never drove a car never rode a bicycle never swam in a body of water she didn't do a lot of the things that we take for granted but she did so much else and uh growing up with her was a really cool balance for my life right as a kid and uh, i was in a punk rock and rebellion and yada yada and she was a good balancing act for that because she saw the energy in me and always just said make sure you burn bright but burn slow enough that you can do it for a long time and so that became the the slow burn kind of mantra of my life. Slow fuse. Slow fuse actually is just something that came around because I couldn't get slow burn as a name in a video game that I was playing. <laughs> so slow fuse became the name because I was like, well, what else makes sense? It's not, if I can't get slow burn, then what can I do? And so I did slow fuse and it just stuck. There you go. JP put a, a link to <clears throat> Wikipedia for Rick Genist. And that's some yeah, interesting tattoos. He's called Zombie Boy. Yeah, bad life choices do not make well, you a model. <laughs> but it, it, and this is, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Before he had any tattoos, Zombie Boy was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Zombie Boy was on the waiting list for six months where he contemplated his own life and possible death before undergoing the surgery with minimal complications. Waiting list for what? Like, brain? A brain transplant? Brain? They're trying to do so. a brain transplant. Somebody said, well, right. I don't think is that a head done transplant? For him. There's a doctor that's <laughs> planning a full head transplant later this year, which I don't understand. Uh, Viking, yes, we will definitely look at some whip towards the end of the show. It's 4.30 right now. Key Lime said he's going to be about 15 minutes late. So right around 5 o'clock, we'll take a look at whip before we end the show. For sure. Liz Gray, you do what you want. 
All right, so uh, next color up is going to be a lighter brown. Now, here's the thing. As you go through an airbrush, remember how we talked about earlier, have a plan in place for how to adjust your colors as the model starts working with what you've picked. In the case of airbrushing and working as thin as we do, one of the biggest cases that you'll find is that we picked a dark brown, but because of the way we ran our highlight, notice how we've already got a light brown coming out from underneath right, because of the whites showing through. So we already got a really good looking tan on the model. So that tan is lighter than what we'll get out of this. <laughs> so we can scrap our mid-tone and not even use it and pretty much go straight to desert yellow. Make sense? Because we already got our brown because of the white underneath it to represent our mid-tone for us. And I never want to expect that to happen because sometimes as I'm working with the model, I'll overshoot that because of wanting to build up shadows a little bit more. Uh, and so I'll darken up that highlight a little bit and I'll go to a mid-tone. So I always try to pick a triad of colors to use. But more often than not, if you're airbrushing, you'll lose that mid-tone. We say that all the time because if you do your pre-highlight right, your first base color does double the work. Okay, But if you're brush painting, you'd want all three of these, obviously. See you later, Doug and Ozel. Makes sense. Good nose will take it easy, man. Congrats. All right, makes sense. So we're going to eliminate our mid-tone and we're going to go straight to desert yellow. And I do want to use the desert yellow because I'm already seeing through the white and that oak brown a little bit of yellow content in my browns. So I want to keep that trend going. Warboy said this is going to be great for painting my Space Marines. Awesome technique. And now I can really get some use out of my Neo. Great, man. Yeah, it's it's uh, learning the light and the balance and value that I teach pretty much every stream is the key so that that pre-highlight, and I'm gonna use a model that was given to me by one of our viewers, right? As a way to highlight what can happen if you overdo your pre-highlight, okay? And here, this model is oversaturated with too much white, okay? So as a pre-highlight, you've got really good shadows that still poke through because the angle was good from the airbrush or the, uh, this was airbrushed. So the angle was good on the airbrush. I still am retaining my, my shadows where they need to be, but the amount of white was not varied to stay brighter at the top and dimmer at the bottom. We've got bright saturated all the way top to bottom. So if you were to go through and layer this up with a base coat, you're going to wind up with not enough variance. You'll get very dark patches and then very light patches. So you miss that mid-tone gray. So the thing to be careful of is that as you spray, make sure that you uh, focus your the buildup of white from the, the belly button to the shoulders, that V that's there, and then the arms as necessary. If you've got an arm that's low, this one can stand to be a little bit more gray. This one's high, so more white. So this was actually good, and around the shoulders is really good and done very well on this model. And then starting at the waist, you start being too bright. So just be careful with that balancing of value because that's the forethought that makes all the difference in how the next layer and technique that you do presents itself on the model. If you overbalance your white, you're too bright and oversaturated with white, then when you go to put your next color on, you're gonna get super dark and super bright and you're gonna miss those mid-tones. And missing mid-tones is tough because those are the hardest ones to put back on the model and not mess up the shadows or the highlights. Make sense? Because you're having to fit mid-tones in between and so that doesn't really work. So uh, just make sure that you balance it. Notice the difference if I look at like a model like this, right? Notice how I've got much more variance and gradation between my whites and my blacks. I still have very black shadows, but I have gray covering most of the model. So just be careful when you do that. Tony Danza did porn? What? No. Could be a thing. Could be a thing. Uh, Uncle Touchy wants you to hold him closer. Hold you closer? Mm -hmm. Tiny Dancer? Is that where we're going? <laughs> That's what Ray Silver said. Oh, this is what we're doing? <laughs> Oh, this is and what we Well, and then uh, Uncle Touchy said that he thought the words were Tony Danza until he was 17. And Ray said, that makes the fact that Tony Danza used to do porn all the creepier with your name as context. I didn't know oh. that Tony Danza did porn. The guy yeah, from Who's the right. Boston Taxi. A Reaper from Overwatch vibe from that model? Yeah, maybe. I did not mention names, JP. <laughs> Hold me closer, George, George Costanza. Costanza. <laughs> Is that a song too? I feel like that's not a song. It should be Could though. Be. All right, Desert Yellow's next. Tiny Dancer. A couple drops of paint, just like we do. Paint down inside the well. None in the cup. You don't need that much paint when you're doing this. You, you know, you waste so much if you just throw a bunch of paint in the cup. And then. 
Again, just enough <laughs> flow improver to be at the bottom of the cup. That's my math. He was a great, he was a great wingman, that George Costanza. Best paintbrush in the world. Again, I hate that I have to make you guys jealous by having this amazing <laughs> mixing paintbrush. Um, the Muppet. No, brush. I'm not going to tell you where it came from. No, I'm not going to send you one. Limited You're just going to have to grow up and realize that the world is a hard place and some things you have to do on your own. Very expensive. <laughs> Ray Silver said, isn't Hold Me Closer George Costanza Fart Noise one of the smash hits by Rated X? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Why did we ever tell them these things? Why did we ever tell them these things? I was 18. I was between 16 and 18 when those things were made. And then we recorded it when I was like, I think right before my 19th birthday or right after my 19th birthday or something like that. How does Harry Potter get down hills? No idea. Me either. Not bad joke Friday. This is not <laughs> allowable. Every day is bad. Every day is bad joke day. We this is love true. him here. This is true. I saw a good one. It's it's more of a visual bad, uh, good joke. I told another one the other day, right? Didn't I? I feel like I told one the other day. Walking. And you JK, laughed at me. Rolling. <laughs> like rolling. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the top of this shoulder. And I'm just going to start layering in some of this desert yellow. Uh, so I saw a good joke, but it's visual, but I can describe it. It was a stick figure with no arms. Okay, that's the setup. Stick figure Is with no arms. Is this you doing this? You're telling us? I'm telling you. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were reading. No, I'm telling you that I saw this joke today. Stick figure with no arms. The caption said, this is Bob. Bob has no arms. Knock, knock. Who's there? Not Bob. It's not Bob. <laughs> sure shit ain't Bob. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going back and following the preset up and dropping oh. in that highlight across the tops of the arms, anywhere where I see that light Side brown look, popping up. a good point. Side look reminds you that it's Friday in some places. Oh, damn it. And he's <laughs> right because it's Thursday here. Sons of bitches. I hate when everybody's <laughs> right and I'm wrong. Chuck Whiffendiffer says... It's not bad joke day. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Shit. We're did so the, screwed. Did the issue get resolved so you could go take care of your business there, Chuck? I don't really need to know. <laughs> did you take care of How did it turn <laughs> out? That was funny. Did it all come out okay? I just thought it was funny that there was something that would be a priority over going to the bathroom. <laughs> the only day of the week that doesn't end in Y. Tomorrow. That's a good one. That's it. Ah, uh -huh, yes. Okay. Grabbing those same areas where I want a little bit of highlight. Played. Basically, any of those areas exactly. where I went back and focused in with a little bit of white. Now I'm going back in and focusing in with this desert yellow. <laughs> that is very true. Um, Slade said, legend has it that the hair on that brush is made from Tibetan yak hair that's been blessed by Buddhist monks. Hey, you're not supposed to give away all our secrets. I don't understand how it is that you think you got permission to just <laughs> tell everybody our secrets. That's why it's so rare. I had to climb a very, very high mountain to get that brush blessed. <laughs> And those yak hairs were carefully woven together by the tiny, nimble hands of blind children. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Blind child brushes. <laughs> Stooping to new lows. <laughs> Warboy said, nah, it's sable butthole hairs. Yep. <laughs> there you go. After midnight, but you haven't gone to sleep yet. I think it's still Thursday for you then. Oops, uh, move to the left a little bit. There we go. Perfect. Toes out here. A little bit down the side of the uh, outside of the calf there. Spot right there. 
a little bit as we wrap around the thigh with this plate coming out right above the knee. So. <laughs> Are they Tibetan monk hairs blessed by yak? That could be too. That's, that's a different brush, actually. He has that one too. Yeah, we don't show you that one yeah, very often. He keeps that one hidden. A little more disturbing. <laughs> Which will ban us if we use the human hair brushes live. <laughs> Uncle Tetsu wants burgers. You keep saying that. We'll go for burgers. You keep not showing up at our door. <laughs> I don't think you realize how easy the world is. You show up, we eat burgers. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of the way it works, man. Again, keeping a very hard angle on the model so that I don't intrude on any of my panel lines, but oh, I get you can't that nice buildup. This is one pound of glass balls, though. Hey, hey. <laughs> she's got the new glass ball. We found bigger balls. <laughs> bigger balls. The balls, they are bigger now. I've got big balls. She's got big balls. <laughs> oh, yeah, Liz, when you come back, when you and Parker come back. Double egg. Oh my god. I was right. telling all the new Seen people. That? I'm keeping a hard angle so I get just with one spray, I get the, the desert yellow up at the <laughs> top of the calf and then down at the bottom of the heel where that flare comes better, back out. Last. But I'm not really intruding a lot on the panels in between. It allows me to have my <laughs> color separation, right? <laughs> something something shoving this joke about one pound balls. <laughs> something something. <laughs> I was telling all the um, our new people the other day about all our favorite we were talking about favorite restaurants because there's the one lady who lives over here and so i was talking about ingo's and their delicious deviled eggs and one of them looks at me he's like who goes to a restaurant and gets deviled eggs and i'm like um jen right here <laughs> me? i do because yeah. <laughs> they're good culinary dropout has good ones too so they're glass they're glass balls not brass and not, and brass would be steel. funny too <laughs> steel balls well we'll leave jp at home and the rest of us will go have deviled eggs. You would think JP would have learned already <laughs> that like saying that you don't like food around us isn't a way to make it happen because we'll take you to the place that'll change your mind. We changed his mind about freaking Mexican food. Well, I don't know if we changed his mind. But... <laughs> Uncle Tetsu said, Mr. Fuse, are you giving me an open invite to ring your doorbell? Hell yeah. <laughs> you know the drill. Jen might argue. <laughs> like, well, know. you can ring it all you want. We might not answer, but... <laughs> well, the funny thing is we don't have a doorbell, That's so there's true. that, too. That's true. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Some poop jokes. Yay! <laughs> we want, uh, Rob wants to know if we want anything from Applebee's. Yes, no, wait, wait. Worst <laughs> wait, restaurant ever. Nobody Applebee's? actually eats there, do they? Is that the Applebee's that serves alcohol to children? Then we would like a drunk child, please. Because <laughs> that would be fun for we'll a night. collect all the drunk children. Bring them over. Take good care of them. That really sounds creepy. <laughs> I, I, as I was saying it, I'm like, we should not be saying <laughs> yeah. this. This is horrible. That's true. We, really, we don't want the drunk children. <laughs> oh, how do you get the bathroom to unlock in a hurry? With a dookie. Oh. oh. Cheese so and real good. bacon. That's so good. good. Yet so bad. All right. <laughs> so there we've amped up our brightness. We've got that kind of cool yellow hue in there that we're going for. Right? We didn't <laughs> intrude on party. our shadows, so we've still got really good panel derivation here. Everything <laughs> looks really good. Good shadows where we need them. I'm digging it. Now we need to amp that up a little bit. And I think what we're going to do, I don't yeah. know if I have a brighter <laughs> desert yellow, like right in the pot. As I'm looking around, I don't know that that's a thing. So I might just add some ivory, although this troll claws <laughs> looks pretty damn good. We've been it? on them for a long time already. Now I think I'm gonna add ivory straight to desert yellow. Cause we already got desert yellow in the pot. So this makes it easy, easy to do. And uh, JP said that you didn't change his mind. He was just being nice. <laughs> <laughs> but JP lies. He's a lying liar who lies, so I don't believe any of that. All right, we are going to put a little <laughs> bit of sheen. So the ivory here, according or going into our desert yellow, is going to give us a brighter color that we can do some spot highlights with. The 
The ivory is model color. It's a very thick <laughs> paint, so we don't need thing. too much. I'm just going to put one little drop. You can't even tell that I put it in there. The magic paintbrush will mix it all up and hopefully give us a mucho brighter color. Not an issue because we're not moving. What's that? Uh, we're on the, a government watch list because we were talking about how we wanted the drunk. We wanted to see the drunk children. <laughs> <laughs> and and Ray said you have to register when you move now. Oh really? Bummer. No. So we just don't move. We're just not moving. Okay, cool. But so I, don't, never I don't think you have to register to be on a watch list. That's the sex offender list. We are not on that list. No, we just, <laughs> we just yeah, no. Let's just stop talking about it. <laughs> Rob's the one that brought up the fact that at the Applebee's by his house, they serve children alcohol and get drunk kids. And we yes. were like, we just want to go to that Applebee's not to eat the food, but just to stare at the drunk children. Now watch how drunk children act. I think children already act like they're drunk anyway. Right? Ooh. So there's if you get so a child many parallels, drunk, there's so many similarities between toddlers and drunk people. You never know when they might barf. They fall down a lot. They, they do they, fall they down. Can't walk, walk, they can't walk straight. Can't recite their ABCs. <laughs> yeah. They slobber. Yep, lots of drooling. A lot of drooling. Lots of cussing. Wait, what? Sometimes they cry for no reason. <laughs> lots of cussing. <laughs> All right, give, same give thing. Give me food now or I'm going to cry. <laughs> Starting here on the shoulder. Ginger beer mimosas. What? Why are you telling Liz? She doesn't live here. Tell us this. <laughs> Get that line underneath the uh, the face there. On the neck, I don't want to brighten this up too much, but I want to catch these edges. Nine months? What? Do you guys have a date yet, though? Or is it just, like, about nine months? Isn't that a really bad movie? A chick flick? Yeah, you're asking the wrong person. If you're asking me, I don't watch chick flicks. <laughs> this is true, which is a good thing. <laughs> Uh, Slade wants to know, would this just take longer to do with having airbrush? With a regular brush? Is that what you said? It just says, would it take longer to do without an airbrush? Oh, yeah, definitely. Without an airbrush, all of this becomes a whole different deal because you've got to work harder at all of your blends and all of that, right? Viking, he pops in once in a while. We saw him a couple weeks ago, I think. Who's that? Nothern. Oh, yeah, yeah. Said he's been having a hectic summer. I don't remember what it was he was doing. Top of the arm. Here, any of these areas, again, remember that what we're doing is trying to set up some good value, so we want to get bright where that light would hit. So across the shoulders, back of this neck, onto the backpack. Again, doing a cool top down, kind of a highlight on there. Oh, was that on Sunday, Uncle Touchy? Because we were out till lunch. At, at Ingo's, we were eating deviled eggs and burgers. <laughs> I'm not supposed to actually tell him that. That kind of like hurts his feelings, I'm sure. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And I was like, uh, we're eating delicious burgers with Jenny's cousin. We had to take my cousin there. For this coming up weekend, you invited him to brunch and he didn't respond? Because now we're going to have a problem. <laughs> There's something you'd like to tell me over there? What? Uncle Touchy said he invited you to brunch and you never responded. I, what are you talking about never responded? He said, let's do brunch. I said, make it happen. Oh. Let me know. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. I don't remember what I said. Maybe I didn't respond. I feel like I responded, though. A little bit on those thigh plates, all right? But I'm gonna stop dropping the brighter color now uh, as we go down the model, because remember what I said, you wanna keep your values centered around the top where it would be brightest, and then let your mid-tones and everything take place down low. Gangsta Bubba Gumbo, what's up? More on the top of the shoulder pad there. At the inside of the arm. 
this outside arm hey, here. Flip. Again, top down on this one. Feel like I might want a little bit on the heels just to spice the back end up a little bit. And outside of the heel, back of the. I'm barely using any paint here at all. all right, just a little bit of a spot highlight back there. Not too much. I don't want to, again, drag too bright of a value on the lower portion of the model. But I've got these areas where we've got like that little poke out on the heel plate. And a little bit of shine on the back. Uncle Touchy, if you are a, a brunch expert. Because so much of this model falls into shadow down below. Then I have a task for you. I need you to find me a place that has a good Bloody Mary bar. I don't want just a pitcher of tomato juice and some vodka. I want a whole spread that includes things like beef jerky and bacon and celery and olives and a little Tabasco and... All the good stuff. So you find that. Very demanding, this one. <laughs> very, very demanding, this or one. Or a place where maybe they don't have a Bloody Mary bar, but they have those fancy Bloody Marys that are like a whole meal. Like there's one that I've seen that has a cheeseburger on top of it. Yeah. Find what? that place for me. That's a thing? <laughs> a little bit on the toes. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks to Bubba Gumbo said, check this out. I've been out of streams for a while, I haven't been painting, but just found out about a local gaming shop that has a big crowd, and I ran into Iron Headed there. Didn't oh, really? You're in, uh, you're in El Paso? Time. Far out. Have a good night, Duster. Take it easy. See you next time. Uh, we're backing up. I can see it happening in the cup, and I must have gunk on the tip. Well, Viking, we've, we've said it a bunch of times that it really does make a difference that there's no humidity. <laughs> when it's hot, you sweat, but the sweat does what it's supposed to do. But right that being said, we don't mow our own lawn. <laughs> What's that? Viking was saying he had to cut the front and back lawn today, and it's awful. That it's just too big, the grass grows too fast, it's too hot, he doesn't understand how we live here. Yeah, it's freaking hot. So, nice. very hot. And yeah, next week they said it's going to be like 120 degrees outside. So we just don't go outside on those days, unfortunately. All right, bingo. Hash Kitchen has a Bloody Mary bar with a bacon section. And they also have the ginger beer mimosas. Done. Let's go there. All right. There's our browns. I got my desert brown armor that I wanted. Now I can start bringing in my blacks to black out all of the under, uh, the suit underneath is going to be black, but we've got a good metallic sheen worked up on our browns. That's why I brightened up just these lower plates. We keep our shading going in, but notice how we've still got a good mid-tone brown from our highlight, even though we didn't really paint much of our brighter browns down here. It was just the fact that our whites and grays are still showing through. We've got a good amount of, uh, let's do a little bit of highlight <laughs> on this backpack. Lasagna. I feel like on the bottom right here of this part of the backpack needs a little bit of color. And Anthony, bacon pancakes are just regular pancakes with little pieces of bacon in them. So it's so, a sweet and savory and it's delicious. I can glaze that. I needed a little bit more color there and I probably would have hit it with the secondary brown, but I want that to have a little bit of shine to it on the backpack. We'll have to glaze that with some straight desert yellow since I mixed all my desert yellow in with the ivory already. All right. That's looking good. I feel like we're pretty good everywhere. I want to get a little bit of glow. That looks delicious. Oh, it almost looks like a little beer garita kind of thing, which is also something we enjoy from time to time. I dig it. Looking good. -a. And now, just to amp one level up higher, let's go with just straight ivory in the pot real quick. Um, I know, right? Interrupting our breakfast talk. I'm going to clean a little bit of this so out. Rude. Me? 
Am I interrupting something with, you know, my painting? Is that how this is going? Uncle Touchy, said, Uncle Touchy said, who's this dude that keeps interrupting our breakfast conversation? Oh, my God, you people. <laughs> I'm trying to do things here that, that are bettering lives. <laughs> All you guys are talking about is Bloody Marys because and bacon. it's good, Ray. That's why. It's good. <laughs> bacon yes. freaking. We're going to rename the channel Jen and the guy that interrupts food conversations. Damn it. I could definitely spend all of the stream time talking about food. She could, actually. I really could. All right. We're going to do some straight ivory. Straight ivory. One drop is enough. This stuff is so thick. Literally barely any paint in there at all. And we don't have a whole lot of coverage to do. I just want to make sure we get a little <laughs> bit of extra sheen on this before we head off into the night. Take a look at some whip. Call it a day. I don't eat breakfast every day. But when I do eat breakfast... It's brunch. I eat, I eat breakfast. Yeah, that's just true. She doesn't eat breakfast ever. But when she does, she eats like all, all the breakfast. The breakfast. She enjoys breakfast whenever we do do it. <laughs> I do love but it's it. usually got to find like a good brunch place, right? Because yeah. it's got to have like choices. I would love a really good Mexican brunch. Something with like breakfast burritos you can make yourself, mm -hmm. things like that. We just, believe it or not, here in Arizona, we, it's not something well, that we found. I think that there are some of the places around here have it. We just have not gotten Down. up early enough recently to go for breakfast. On All the right. Weekend. But we will do that. So this is going to be an even smaller highlight. So I'm going to get in super close on this shoulder pad. And yes, my hand is up, Uncle Touchy. All right, and give it that ivory glow right in the middle there. Uh, what's the mini called and what game? What's that? What is this mini called and what is the game, or which game? Uh, this is from Infinity, and this is a Suriat with heavy rocket launcher. They are basically space monkeys. They're like a, a, a primate race of aliens that are here to take over the universe so it's like planet of the planet of the apes they're awesome they're called morats but this uh, particular morat is called a suriat yeah i it's I, I viking i sometimes wake up in the morning craving dinner type foods all right so get it just a little bit of a so glow I there i feel like i'm not getting very good paint flow so i'm gonna make sure my needle is clean Again, biggest thing, if you're ever at the point where you feel like you should be getting paint out of your airbrush and you're not, don't pull the trigger more. Clean the needle. DBD, I'm not sure if we can be friends anymore. What did he do? He says, I don't like bacon. What's wrong with that? You don't have to like bacon. Nothing <laughs> says you have to like bacon. You're weird and wrong, <laughs> but nothing says you have to like bacon. bit on that forearm. Oh, I love cold pizza for breakfast. Get a little bit on the chest area here, but not much. Again, I just want to kind of lightly dust <laughs> the chest right there. I can't eat bacon. I, I feel, I feel bad that? for people who have those unfortunate food intolerances. I get a little bit of ivory with your bacon talk right on the bottom mm. line right there underneath his chin and then just a slight glow as it goes down. You don't want to overload that area. All right, and then a little bit on this forearm. <laughs> just a spot glow on the forearm there. I mean, I'm getting super close and putting this very, very hurts. little paint on the model right now. <laughs> Do a little bit on this edge here. This just gives it that little bit of punch for that <laughs> metallic sheen that we're going for. But Ray Silver wants to know if you're going to do any military greens to offset the browns and kind of tie it together. Um, I'm not doing any greens. I'm doing bright green for the lenses on this, like his eye lenses. But I do not plan on doing any uh, camo style greens or anything, no. I'll be doing red markings to offset give it some added warmth and then I'll be doing a nice blue metallic glaze on the heavy rocket launcher to bring a little <laughs> bit more cool coloring onto the model. 
But no, I don't. I don't plan to do any green. I don't believe uh, too much more green right now, and it starts muddying it up too much. I wanted kind of a desert armor theme, and so green really doesn't play into that. Lots of black that'll be you know shiny non-metallic blacks on him. So I think that'll take the place of needing a whole lot of uh, variants. But again, you know, the, the key is to always let the model do the talking. And if you get to a point where you're like, nah, you know what? It really needs something. Then, you know, there's no telling. But it's not in my plan right now to do that. No. I want a little bit of shine right there on the elbow. That's so how I'm shooting past the model and just, I'm, I'm basically aiming at my finger in the background and then just bringing the airbrush in so that the overspray hits the tip of the elbow there to give it a little bit of shine. Uh, Warboy said, for painting black, should I get Vallejo Surface Primer or Badger Steinol Res? Steinol Res. All day, every day. A little bit more pop on the top of that shoulder. A little bit of ghost glow on the edge of the shoulder back here. Same thing right down here. A little bit of glow along the edge of the shoulder pad there in the secondary. We get a nice value as it goes down, but not doing any of this uh, pure ivory on the lower side of the model is the key. Put more right here behind the head. Collar. Pretty happy with this. Want a little bit on this elbow. I'm shooting past the elbow again. You can see, I want to get just a little bit right on that elbow. So I'm going to shoot past it. And then again, just let the overspray come in like that. I get just a little bit of ivory on that corner. Give it a shine. And I still have that nice sheen on the, the six-pack abs, but I'm not going to use the ivory in there so you get the depth of the model, right? We've got our mid-tone browns and our dark browns inside, and when we edge highlight, we'll edge highlight that with that mid-tone brown as opposed to the brighter ivory, and we'll, we'll outline everything out towards the front with the ivory, which will give it that metallic sheen, right? A really good look on this guy. I'm very, very happy with the way these colors are working. I need a little bit of ivory on this hand out here. Just at the top and fade it down real quick. <laughs> Just a light stroke like that. Just gets that top wrist piece, I guess. I'm not sure what this means, but DVD said immersion broke. I don't even believe your airbrush is bigger than your head. What? I don't know. DVD, I don't understand. How could you say such a thing? A little bit of glow down that ridge. I think. Be donezos with that. I don't feel like I want too much. Ivory, if any, down here. Maybe a little bit just on this thigh area. Let's see if I can amp it up just a hair right here at the beginning. Like that. Brightening things up too much. A little bit on the outside of this hip plate. So we get that metallic sheen for the this angle of the egg leg egg egg sticking out right gives me a little bit of shine there this hip plate gives me a little there and i feel like that's pretty good a little on the outside of the knee again you just kind of work through and balance it as you need to just get that edge of the knee plate there a little bit i feel like that's very very nice Good metallic sheen, keeping our brightest areas up between the shoulders from the hips to the shoulders, right? So we've got this bright saturation around the collar, hand, shoulder plate, 
arm, but down here we're relying on that mix of desert yellow and ivory to provide our highlight, and it gets brighter as we go up, which gives us that depth and the value of you know where our light source is coming from the top. Right? So we get a natural shading on the model just by not highlighting as bright down low. Right? So we get it to be much brighter up top. Okay. Oh. Bingo, all of that done with just a good attention to detail with a pre-highlight. That's, mm, I want to say 50, 60% of the work was setting up a really good pre-highlight on it so that everything else became really easy. You know, we did a good pre-highlight. We found what we learned that just the oak brown did a bunch of the work because we got most of our tans and light browns out of just the oak brown interacting with the white. You'll learn that about different paints as you use them. Some paints, you'll need that mid-tone. Some paints do really well over a pre-highlight when you thin them out and have a really nice transition from a mid-tone to not. Some paints you'll find become a different hue. Um, we've shown you with one of my favorite colors, Parasite Brown. If you use Parasite Brown over a pre-highlight, you start getting really bright orange real quick. So you may actually want the brown color and then the orange overtakes. And so you'll wind up painting over the orange with a tan or something to knock it down a little bit. So certain colors react differently to the white undertones from the pre-highlight. So you just have to play around with it. Uh, purples and reds can become pink. Um, and so if you're going towards a true red, you'll get that, but then you'll have to glaze red back over those bright areas in order to really strengthen them and bring them back into the hue that you want. So you'll have to play with it. This brown performed fantastically. We didn't have to do any of that. All we had to do was worry about going ahead and proceeding with our highlights. We got really good transitions, really good shine. Now all I got to do is go back in and black things out where we've got like overspray in the, the suit areas where the black is underneath. And uh, once I do that, then uh, we'll have a good level to start from. You'll get to really see all those contrasts pop. So good stuff. I like the color so far. It really was a, a, a lesson for me to learn to uh, figure out if I can do my entire Morat army in these desert tans. And I think I can. I like it a lot. Michael Modi, because you are one what? They're the Tyranids of Infinity, sort of, except they don't just go eat planets. They actually want to make people come over to their side, you know? So almost more like a, a Gene Stealer cult or something like that. Bacon scented paint. No, you don't, because then you drink the shit. <laughs> That's why I always hated that they made like markers that smelled like grape. Yeah. Because <laughs> he always wanted to, like, lick the marker, and that was the worst thing on the planet. Never tasted the same. <laughs> Never airbrush, Michael? Guess you just find normal brush painting more relaxing and more practical, especially at night in the house. Yeah, I mean, airbrush is a great tool. You know, when people uh, bring up the question of, you know, because we paint a lot just with brush. I mean, like I've been showing you the... Uh, all of the, the Kingdom Death stuff that I'm doing, there's absolutely no airbrush on these guys at all. So you can still get really nice transitions. You can get really cool. We're doing a lot of non-metallics, like on all the chain work and stuff like that here. Um, so you can get really cool stuff from just brush. Uh, it just is a different technique that I plan for from the beginning of a model, as opposed to, you know, if I'm going to airbrush, then I'll do all the pre-highlight. You know, I, I mix the paints a little bit differently. I can set up the basis for what I do to where I can get to this level and it helps me to where now I'm at the pure detail level of brushing. I don't have to blend on the top surfaces and things like that for big armor plates. Um, you know, so it, it just, it's a preference. There's, there's not a reason to use it or not. It's just for things that are armored. I like the airbrush. Uh, Jack of Clubs, thank you for the host, Wyatt. Um, so it, it literally is just another tool in your toolbox. I feel like having the the best set of tools, man, will help you get on, into and out of any situation as you're painting in miniature. Uh, there are going to be times where painting vehicles, you don't want to just do it with a brush. Uh, there's just no argument that an airbrush is the de facto method for painting vehicles in large surfaces, large flat surfaces, especially because of coverage. Um, you know, they don't paint our cars that we buy for ourselves with paintbrushes, right? They paint them with spray guns. So, and that's just for coverage. So again, it's just a tool that you can use as you need to. It's not better or worse. Uh, and it's only judging on your skill and your comfort with it. I know people who paint at the absolute highest level in the world who have never touched an airbrush. 
Uh, I know people who paint at the absolute highest level in the world that paint 90% of everything they do with an airbrush. So, you know, it literally is. And when you look at both those models, you wouldn't say, I like that. I mean, you might say, I like that one better because of the model and the colors and whatever. But literally, you'd look at them both and go, yep, great, fantastic, never going to be that good. <laughs> you know, I look at them and I go, yep, beat me. I don't care. I don't care how you painted it. It's awesome. But they're just tools. And, uh, and I never try to push people to use a tool you're not comfortable with. It's just like anything else. I wouldn't have you go, I wouldn't ask Jen to go cut a board on the table saw because I know she's not comfortable with the tool. So I wouldn't say that, well, that's the only way to cut a board. You know, I, we'd find another way to cut a board with something she was comfortable with. You know, so, and it's the same way with painting because you want the end product to be something good. Obviously, we're not going to lop our fingers off with an airbrush, but it's the same mentality. If you're not comfortable with a technique, if you're not comfortable with a tool that you see me using, speak up and ask a question because there's other ways to do it. We could do all of this with the brush. It would just take us longer to work these blends out um, and to get the colors that we want and things like that. Michael, are you kidding me? Thank you. I, I feel like I feel like you're absolutely going above and beyond, my friend. I hope you never feel like that's something that you have to do. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Michael, showing the big time support today, guys. Exclamation point hype in chat. That's another giveaway for the end of the stream. Thank you so much. But yeah, never fail. If you see me doing something with a technique that you don't understand or that you're not comfortable with or whatever, ask me, how would I do that? We had somebody earlier ask, how could I do this with a brush? Would it just take longer? Yeah, it would just take longer because you're going to spend more time uh, blending wet, working thin to get your smooth transitions over big armor plates, but you could definitely do it. I know lots of people that do. Um, so there's nothing that holds you back from being able to do that same thing. So never feel like just because you're seeing something on any of these streams that you, you're you forced into a niche where you have to do that technique in order to get that look. There's lots of things I can explain to you that will help you get the same look with the tools that you're comfortable with and that you have at your disposal. But thank you so much, Michael. Where you live, game shops are ridiculously hard to come by. I can imagine, man. So you don't get to buy what you want for minis without like a week wait time. Gaming, especially for 40K, is almost impossible. So painting is just what you can do. No, that's, you know what? And it's good that you're pulling the hobby along as you can. It sucks that you're in a, you know, a, an end where it's tough and, and tougher to kind of get it to have any growth, right? Can't share your former art with anyone who appreciates you. You can share it here, Michael. Knock that brush out and show it up on whip. Full oh, sure. Glad to have you as a part of the community for sure. Uh, you can see the same flavors, like when you rim a mason jar with crushed bacon and use it for a Bloody Mary. Oh my God, why are we talking about this? Because that, that sounds, sounds really delicious. good, actually. I don't even like Bloody Marys. A tenth of the combined army? Exactly, Ray. Or one thousandth? Yeah, the combined army is so huge, they're only sending out, like, the probe agents right now, and they're absolutely decimating the human sphere with just their rejects. We haven't even seen the big stuff yet. Like the ships that they're sending in to the current, if you're into Infinity stuff, there's a current narrative campaign going on uh, and it's called the Wotan. It's the defense of the Wotan gate or something, Operation Wotan, I don't remember what it is. But the Wotan Stargate is a transport between the, the human in, you know, uh, inhabited part of the galaxy and the outer rim where the, the combined army is showing their first display of force and taking a planet. And so that, that gate needs to be protected because it's the only way that the, the combined army can get in to the rest of the populated sphere. And, uh, and right now the ships that the combined army are using in this combat, we're being told, are like rentals that they don't even care about. They're just like renting ships from dilapidated old shipyards and putting soldiers they don't care about in them. And they're already wrecking face. So we haven't even seen like the stuff they care about yet. They're just like probing us to see if it's worth it kind of a thing. It's a cool story when you think about it like that, because they're like absolutely kicking ass with like junk right now. And if we have, if we get them pissed off and they bring the big stuff in, we're probably doomed. You got to frame your certificate, Ogre. I wish yeah, I could I, sign them all. <laughs> Maybe that's a thing we'll do. We'll we print out the certificate. Print, well, we could make one, print it, have you sign it, and then scan it back in so it looks like your signature on it. Yes, this is what will happen. MW Cannon, do I have pics of my work area? You want to integrate your airbrush into yours, and I'm looking for some ideas. Um, can I very quickly, without making everybody sick, let's do this. I'll just unscrew my video camera here. It's the easiest thing, I think, for me to do. And we will uh, kind of zoom out. Hold on to your lunch, folks. Uh, here's all the, the, there's all you guys and all the computer rig <laughs> set up and everything. There's Jen somewhere over there with Jen's green screen. 
<laughs> there's all of my works in progress. All the commission painting stuff that's going on currently is always up there and down there and all of my garbage here. There is the hobby closet that has, there's all sorts of my tools and uh, palette paper and there's two big racks of product that I can't, I think I have enough. No, I don't have enough distance on the camera to be able to pull it out, but right like here. Yeah, you can see that drawer right there. There's a big stack of, of uh, shelving with drawers in there that has all of the, the terrain making stuff custom effects paints and things like that. Uh, all of the paint racks extend across there. <laughs> There's more models over there. He's not sitting. Huh? He's not sitting. He's standing right I'm now. standing up. I work at a standing desk. Um, yeah, so there's I'm more. I'm sitting, but he's standing. More models over there. Her desk is a standing desk, too. She's just yeah. got it in the sitting position. This is where the old pallet cam mount is. There's the pallet. Right, with more models and stuff that we paint. Back in the back is all the store stock. Back across the wall and way over there. And there's more stuff over there. And then there's all the paint racks are over there. That's the army painter rack. The uh, uh, the <laughs> Vallejo smoothie. The Vallejo. There's my smoothie. <laughs> the, the Vallejo paint rack will be going here, where you see all these infinity boxes and stuff right next to the army painter rack. Um, and then there's all my airbrushes. Uh, if I move my smoothie. My airbrush rack is right here, so all my guns are here. Uh, there's a there's a valve here, a pressure valve here that I set all my uh, PSI at local to the desk here. Uh, but there's you know a That's holder right. for four brushes <laughs> there, and then just all my various unsundry tools and crap. Got all everywhere. kinds of saw in today. Shit all That'd over the place, off. man. Uncle says she doesn't believe that you're standing. Show him your feet. <laughs> standing. Feet, Matt. On the floor, there's the chair I use when I am sitting. But I'm stand. There's my socks. <laughs> His legs. My His toes. Shorts. I have my toes. I wriggle my toes. <laughs> He's even seen my setup, like face to face. He has been there, standing there with you, being a floating head. He has. He shirt. was a floating head, cutting my hair behind me and doing awkward man stare. We've shared moments like that, Uncle <laughs> Touchy, and still you act like you don't know me. I wish you had socks that clean. <laughs> At least you have pants on. Yes, proof that he does have pants on today. <laughs> I am wearing shorts. It's a good thing, too, because had I forgotten this was Pantsless Thursday, we would have just got kicked off Twitch. There's my banana hammock and my clean socks. <laughs> Michael Bode, this is the only stream worth watching. Thank you so much Thank for the kind you. words. There are other great streams there out there, are. though. Please look around. There are some great streamers here. A lot of them in this room right now. Don't discount this community. It does great things. But I'm glad that you're here and glad that you're part of our community. You're awesome. If only doing br if doing only brushwork, would you do the pre-shading like with an airbrush? You could definitely do that, Chuck. Uh, I showed once before doing the pre-highlight with um, uh, Malifaux models that we did uh, and those Malifaux, the crew that we did as a commission, I did all the pre-highlight with brush and we painted a lot of them with inks and transparent paints over that to show how you could do a similar effect, but add a bunch of texture because they had like demons and uh, it was the dreamer crew. So it was a lot of demonic skin. So I wanted crazy textures and crazy colors, <laughs> but I did everything by brush. We uh, did all the pre-highlight with brush, everything. You can use uh, medium grays and whites and glaze them on real thin to get your pre-highlight the same way. Just remember that the airbrush gives you a blend you cannot get with a brush. You just can't because of the way an aerosol works and blends because it speckles. Even if it's not textured, it's just very, very fine. I can't even see the speckles, but that's how it works, right? It's spraying, you get a speckle pattern, and then the next paint goes over and overlays that speckle pattern, and so the blend is interlocked. Whereas when you brush, your strokes still have a spot where they start and stop. So even if you blend it nice and smooth, there's still an edge there. Whereas an airbrush doesn't necessarily give you that. It can, but if you're using it right, it doesn't. So the airbrush blending is always going to look a little bit different, but it doesn't mean that you can't get very close and get very smooth looking jobs on your uh, paint just with a brush. And yeah, you just do the pre-highlight the same way, pick your bright spots. Um, you can even just very quickly hit it with a primer. If you prime it black out of a spray can, like most people do, and then you have a spray can of white primer or gray primer, just start the spray primer off to the side, right? So you would aim somewhere over here and spray, and then quickly spray it across the top of the model, swoop it across the top. So it doesn't give you the spotting that a heavy primer will like that, but it'll still give you the quick angle of your light. Then go with your brush, 
and brush in the pre-highlight. So we might do that on stream just to show you guys, right? I might just hit it with the airbrush once to sim symbolize doing it with a, a, an aerosol can of primer um, just to show you your light angle so that you have a reference as you go in and paint. Because what that'll do is it'll hit it, you know, like in our case, it would have hit it off his right shoulder and given us that color real quick. It wouldn't be very bright or vibrant, but it tells us where it needs to go. It would have got the top of the arm, shoulder, head, blah, 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 blah. And then we can go in on our paintbrush and just strengthen those values, right? So there's no reason why you can't do that. Uh, you just have to be careful because the, the heavy can primers will screw up a model real quick if they, you know, blast out a blotch of paint. So that's why I always start way over here and then just swing it across the model real quick. Do we have any black gold in the store? Black gold, like oil? Ennis Ogre said, I'm planning on buying a black gold in the near future. Do you sell any? I'd like to buy from you if possible to support your shop. Tell me what that is because I'm not familiar with it. If you tell me what it is, we might be able to get it in for you if it's something that's usable for a lot of people. I'm not familiar with the term black gold. Is it, I mean, I'm assuming it's not a color, it's a thing. Ray, you like the lore, yeah, definitely. Zy, like, what did I say the monkey faction was called? Combined army. Yep, combined army, Morats, and they are amazing models. This one is my favorite, but because the gun is strapped over the chest, this, this for the Suryats at least, right? The way he's carrying his rifle is just bitching, right? So he's got his combi <laughs> rifle with flamer. Yeah, they're really, really cool models. Black and they, the Morat models are amazing. They only get better. They've got them with uh, dudes that are called witch soldiers that don't have any helmets and long flowing hair and big close combat weapons and look more like samurai monkeys. They're bitching. So there's all sorts of really cool stuff in the combined army. There's also other alien races as part of the combined army. It's not just the Morats. So there's all sorts of things. That's why it's called the combined army. It's all the races they've assimilated that fight as one. Kev Rob said black gold is scale 75. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Yaogats are good too. Oh, okay, if it's a color from scale 75, then yeah, our plan is to carry it in the store for sure. They just have not gotten back to us. I need to keep pounding on them. You sell just the soda beads. I can. I brought in more Ferro Roche just so we could do that. That's with that bottle of 100 tons One of pound. beads. One pound of glass balls. One pound of glass balls that she just showed us. Well, it disappears balls, on the thing, but, you but there you go. There you One can kind of see the word balls down there balls. at the bottom. <laughs> so we've got a big jar of glass balls that, yes, we uh, we had assembled for us, and we can. they just got in the other day. So, yeah, I can do agitators for you. I just It doesn't make sense to sell you uh, agitators for one bottle. Like, if you need 100 of them, yes. If you need five, no. Yeah. I'll just, I mean, you know, send me a quarter and we'll mail you an envelope with five balls in it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> right. uh, Ogre said that um, Jack of Clubs uses it a lot. He uses the Scale 75 version, but I know there's another one. There are other ones. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't find the colors in the Scale 75 line important enough to feel like I wanted to add. I wanted to add them in because a lot of people feel like Scale 75 is a better paint. I don't feel like that's the case. So it's a struggle when the company is so small and they do bad business. I won't say bad business, but they haven't gotten back in touch with me for the many times I've reached out. They do and they're sporadic. I feel like that leaves me in a lurch if we order because you can order the order from them. If I order and then I run out of stock and then I can't restock, then it becomes a problem and stuff doesn't sell. So from a business perspective, I'm afraid to bring them in right now, but I like I like the paints. I just, with the full Vallejo line, we've got model air in right now. we got game color that just came in, the full lines of both along with the army painter, I feel like there's not a color that you can't do. But if, if people are clamoring for it, we wanna to try to offer the things that you can do. It's just that right now, I don't feel starved for not having scale 75. We have a lot of paint. We have a lot of paint. <laughs> gonna do another drawing. Did you try the black 2.0 paint yet? No, but it's still sitting here, right? It's still sitting here. Black, super flat, super matte, ultra pigmented, acrylic paint, non-toxic. Don't use on hot surfaces, light bulbs, radiators, etc. Do keep out of reach of kids. What does it say? If you feel unwell, call a doctor and take this bottle with you. Right? Like just in general. Like if you wake up one day and you've got stomach cramps, go to the doctor and take, take this, this with you because somehow it makes a difference. <laughs> it just sounds very generic, right? If you feel ill, go to the doctor and take this <laughs> bottle with you. It doesn't say if after consuming this paint you feel ill, Take it to the doctor. It's just take that with you everywhere you go <laughs> to the doctor. I think it's great. Cool, Chuck. Yeah, well, we're still trying. I haven't given up on them. Definitely. As soon as it's available, you'll buy the balls. I just need to know what, uh, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow or something. 
All right, let's take a look at some whip and then do a giveaway real quick. All right, so it gives you a couple extra minutes to get in on the giveaway. Exclamation point booty. We got one more giveaway to do. We've done two today so far, but let's take a, 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 a journey over to the whip gallery real quick. What say yous? Any word on the mongrel? Ray what is Sil that? Ray Silver is asking. Any word on the mongrel? Is that what we're calling the, the potential airbrush? Is that what that is? The answer is no. I'm not happy with what has been transpiring with it right now as far as quality, so I don't know that it's going to be able to happen. But, yeah, I'm still working on it. So we might we might be able to see. Uh, we showed this. Uh, buh, 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 buh. What do we got here? Uh, V-Bosch. How do I make the scar stand out more? Let's take a look. V-Bosch, are you still out there? I feel like the thing with scars on these guys, you've got a nice pink flair to it. Um... Hmm. I think that probably the best way to do this, because I really like the color on this scar, right? The flesh is a nice scar pink without going too bright. I feel like your best bet is to go in and, and glaze in a very neat kind of reddish purple around the edges. Darken up the edges so that it separates the scar away from the skin color more. That'll be your barrier for value. Because if you go much brighter here, it starts to look weird, unless you want it glowing which I don't think. I mean, it's just supposed to be, you know, a, a, a scar. And it's great scar color right now. Um, I think darken up the edges. And do that with not a flesh wash. Do it with a purpley scar red. And thin it way down. Build it up in layers. Don't wash the skin. Just go in and very specifically nest it up inside these recesses so you get a dark line between the scar and the rest of the, the skin color. It gives it that irritated feel, like the scar's pushed up out of the skin and the skin's not quite healed around it. I think that would be the best way to do it. Would there be a way to make it like, because a big scar like that, wouldn't it be kind of shiny? You know, like, because that skin is stretched so much? Um, I think that you do that through color, which he's kind of yeah. done. You could do grab the peaks with a little bit of like, maybe, uh, you know, a little bit more of this pinky flesh with ivory and grab a couple more of the spots on the high spots to make it look shiny. I wouldn't go with a gloss varnish or anything because it just looks no. fake. Well, yeah. No, but yeah, I think it, yeah, anyway. if you brightened up just the peaks a little bit and then washed a little bit darker color in there, that, that would work really well. It's a good looking model though. More nerdle goodness. Who's this from? Who did this? You didn't put a name on it. That, that's what's causing me the problem here. Nice. Nice. Again, the wash work on this is looking really good. It's a little heavy on the cowl. It drags the cowl down in value a lot, which for Nurgle can work. Um, your color still brings it up, but I almost want to see a little bit more bright of the bone or parchment color peeking out here and you've got real deep pooling on the wash. But other than that, I mean, it looks good. It's great dirty colors. Those are awesome. I dig it. Those greens are nice. I like the bright green nipples. <laughs> uh, it's 524, probably not Assassin. We'll probably wait until tomorrow for anything else. I did one refresh as I came in. If you uh, can get it in real quick, then yeah, I'll try to do one. Uh, Fluffinator, these are two models that your buddy painted that you wanted to share for the color theory topic we were discussing. Definitely, man. I mean, these are good examples of as you go in with like a blue and an orange and a white, how can you use it, right? The teal, the orange, the white work well together. The only problem that I have with any of this is the choice of the teal in between on the nose, in between the orange here. Those are colors that I would want to keep apart like he's done here with the white. Right? I would almost rather see this be the white in here because the teal and the blue are two, are the, are the, the teal and the orange are two colors that when you put them together, you get that, that weird feeling. Um, and so, but he's done it very minimally. And on the rest of it, he's kept the white to separate it. So it's actually, I mean, it works, right? It's very small increments where he's got them as they come together. So it works there. Same over here. The white is what keeps these from being jarring. You've got enough white in and amongst all the places where blue and orange come together that it spaces the visual nature of the colors out. Your eye 
kind of broadens its view because when you got blue and orange together, you immediately go right where they come together. It's just the way the eye works because that's that shock value part of the model. So yeah, the white, having a good neutral white on here, uh, or even if this was bone or whatever, makes those come together and keeps it from looking what we call clown suit, right? These are good looking models. I like this color scheme. But it's not one that you would normally think, oh, you know what I'm going to do today? Terrigan, pretty old picture and bad quality, but you love this mini. Let me look. Get in here. A little dark. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Squig Riders. Goblin Squig Riders. These are great minis. I love seeing all these old fantasy and 40K minis that you guys keep breaking out. I love the old metal Squig Riders. The sculpts were horrible and yet fun all at the same time. Dig it. Nice one to bust out, man. That's a good one from the archives right there. The certificate of... If you're here earlier, we did color theory with Fuse. You can print off your certificate. You got to show me pictures of it in your, uh, your Beats lab, as Kenny would say. Viking Teabagger, working on demon prints, feeling decent about skin, but would like some feedback. I like it a lot. I like the coloring. I think that if you've watched, which I know you have, because you've got a little bit of like pinkish purple kind of glazed into some of these areas, I would define that a little bit more, right? Work it in so that on around the pustules, it's a little more defined. I know that you've done this with your, uh, what were they called? What were those Nurgle flyers you did? What are those things called? The big flies? I don't know what they're called. Um, you did the same kind of thing around like the yellow pustules that you had and you made it look real irritated. I would go in with a little bit more of that, you know, kind of purpley color. Don't go so purple that it looks like this because you've got the openings in the skin that are, are very good with the deep purples and maroons. So use a different color, maybe a little bit more red and pink for the outside of the skin than you did in here so that it's, it, you know, it's different, right? But other than that, it's nice. I wouldn't use green. Like normally on flesh, I like to use green, but you're doing Nurgle and you got a lot of green on the armor. So try to stay away from green shades on the skin. You can pull a little bit in, but you don't want to make it look like the armor. That's always the big problem with Nurgle is that your standard greens and yellows and things that you want to make skin look nasty and gnarly with don't really work as well because that's what the armor color is. And so you got to go into purples and pinks and reds and browns and things like that. So it's looking good, man. I dig it. I dig it. Blues, blue in amongst that would work really well. Oh, what is that about? I don't know what I did, I broke <laughs> it. I didn't mean to. I didn't, I swear I didn't mean to. Uh, all right, let's do one more refresh. See what we got. Couple more, Assassin. With his Alpha Seed. No, Al... I forget what these are called. Something regiment. Dry brush white done. You feel happy with it? Yeah. Yeah, the dry brush is nice too, right? You just picked up the edges. You didn't get a whole lot of, uh, of texture on the model. So it just gives it a good metal polished edge look. I really dig that. And that blue gunmetal is a great color, man. Even when used in large amounts like this, it still works. I dig it. Nice work. Last but not least, Sublime Miniatures. I'm digging it. Dwarves. The Sky Dwarves. What are these freaking guys called? Very nice work, man. The metallics are looking good. You know, I love the bronzy, coppery look that you got going alongside the gold, the silvers. It all comes together nice. Obviously, blue, great color choice. The green on the hose looks like. Can't tell if that's the whole hose or if it's just a fitting right there, right? The green's just enough plight in there. Um, the brightness of your camera flash, I don't get to see if what you've done as far as your washes. It looks like you're just kind of in your mid-stage. I think now as you start doing a little bit of glazing, if you've been watching like with our metallics, do a little bit of glazing to set the silver apart uh, and start giving a little bit of, of value definition to your metallics. Because that's the hardest thing. The last couple of days, if you've been around watching what we were doing with the... Uh, uh, the Rat Lord's blades is a good way to use as a reference when you're using metallics so that when you have metallics laid up next to each other like that, a lot of times it's hard to control what we talk about in value in terms of brightness and darkness because of the way metallic plays with light, right? They all shine together. And in order to break that up a bit, 
put in a little bit of darkness over there, glaze a little bit of, uh, you know, in the case of silver, glaze a little bit of even, you know, maybe even some blue or some, uh, some green if you want to make it look tarnished uh, to give it some shadow underneath. So you get rid of this ability for it to shine across a whole surface and make it look like it has like a big white racing stripe. You're not in control of that because it's the way metallic paint works. But if you add in a little bit of shadow to give it a little bit more life. But I dig it, man. Great looking model. I love these models, actually. I know that for Tom Shadle, you guys uh, remember Tom, the uh, Mayacast dude. He uh, was thinking about getting into uh, Age of Sigmar just because of these guys. So that's saying something, because I don't think he's big on GW games anymore. All right, gang. We got one last giveaway to do, and then we're out of here. Let's make it happen. We got 92 entries. It's your last chance. By the time you hear this, your chance is over anyway. <laughs> All right, so give me a drum roll, Jed. Oh, I didn't go to the freaking... I didn't go to the page. So lame of me. Oh, person's not online anyway. Same... Oh, really? Okay, so false false deal. Drakenfar, you're not online. Forget that happened. Drakenfar, are you here? Drakenfar. We give them a little bit of time because Twitch is twitchy and sometimes it says they're offline and they're not. The only people that can win and not be here are gold VIPs. Okay, so realize, everybody else, you're offline, tough noogies, <laughs> tough noogies. We'll sit here and call Drakenfar for about another minute, and then we'll pull somebody else. Drakenfar, Drakenfar, Drak. I feel like you'd say that three times in a row looking at a mirror, <laughs> bad things happen. I feel yeah, like that's that kind of name. That. Right? We don't, we don't want that. Drakenfar, stop pooping. <laughs> I think people just need to start taking their phone with them. Kilty, thank you for the bits! When they poop and switch over to their phone so that they don't miss a drawing. Holy cow, look at the bits cup. <laughs> By the way, the frame rate on the bits cup is completely wrong, yeah. so we need to reset that. It's like totally jerking around stuff. You summon Michael Keaton? Is that how that works? <laughs> All right, give us another drum roll. We are replacing Drakenfar with... Grins! Uh, Congratulations to Grins! Grins, another veteran of the show. He knows how all this works. He's here. So, Grins, I need you to bear with us. Get close. Tell your family to exit the room. Dogs, children. <laughs> we missed saying that earlier, and we nearly had a mishap. I'm stretching. Uh, I feel like Get the stretching ready. helps. I was able to actually wink with my right eye earlier, so I feel like that's a good thing. Let's get this going. It will be mine. Oh yes. It will be mine. It will be yours, but not <laughs> before we spread awkwardness across the internet, Grins. Are you with me? <laughs> That's a very good point, Chuck. Chuck said the problem with the phone on the pooper strategy is I am at work. Awkwardness happens when you hear a drum roll coming out of the stall next to you. If your everybody phone doesn't have volume have, buttons. Everybody should have <laughs> their own personal drum roll. I feel like that would be every awesome. Time they poop. If you're pooping. If you're a work pooper, please invest in this tiny little plastic. Who does number two work for? And then drum roll. Maker. Just do it every time. You'll be the hero of the office. <laughs> anyway, let's see what the man wins. Grins. Love it. Grins. Cross what you got. Here it comes. Big box, big box. No whammies. Tutorial time for grins. Tutorial time for grins. Congratulations. Well, she's got the pen. I don't even have to write it down. Freaking awesome. Yes. <laughs> Doing my job. Congrats to grins. Thank you guys so much. The support has been unreal these last few days. Thank you so, so awesome. much to everybody and uh, everybody that's hung out with us. Uh, even if you've just been lurking in the background, if you've been talking in chat, asking questions, hopefully no matter what you've been learning and having fun with us, we have a great community here. We like to not only have a good time, but at least impart a little bit of knowledge with you. Uh, we started off the stream today with color theory. So if you were not here for the beginning, make sure you go back and watch the VOD. I'll be posting this one up on YouTube for sure. Uh, we talked about my kind of... Uh, 
um, my view of the world of fine art and color wheel theory and why it's both good and bad and how you can get the strengths and weaknesses to work for your benefit. So uh, please go back and watch that VOD or hit up our YouTube channel Hi. later on. I'll hopefully get that ported over tomorrow uh, when the video is up and live on Twitch. Uh, so you can go back and watch the beginning there. And then you can go over to the deal and get the certificate of completion and hang it on your wall and take a picture. <laughs> awesome. So I think LT <laughs> made that one and that was awesome. Uh, so again, Gren said he was actually thinking of getting some tutorial time in the future. So yeah, he so ahead of the game. So yeah, you can use that to append on if you'd like to do two hours. You can always use your winning from the wheel and just book an hour of time on through the website, uh, slowfusegaming.com for any of you that are looking for one-on-one -on -one tutorial time. Uh, in the product section, uh, all over the catalog is the one-on-one -on -one, uh, deal. You'll see it. It just says one-on-one. -on -one. It's tutorial time. It pops up a calendar, lets you know my available dates and times. Uh, you can book up two hours. No, nine months. Flip ya! We got a sub baby. Yes. <laughs> We've had so many sub babies this month. It's awesome. But thank you guys so much. Again, uh, feel free to go check out the website. Uh, we will have more products up there on the store as the week goes on with all the new Vallejo stuff going. We got the full line of model air and the full line of game paints, uh, uh, game color paints going up there this week. Uh, so keep checking back on that. Uh, we're restocking things like the Army Painter Mega Paint set. We already sold out of that. Thank you guys so much for all the support over on the store. Uh, we do ship anywhere in the world. So if you ever need a hobby supplies, make sure you check out there first. Thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for talking with us. We will be back again tomorrow. Remember on Fridays, we start at five o'clock Pacific. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, so we're a little bit later on Fridays, but we follow up the amazing Kenny Boucher from Next Level Paintings. Make sure you tune in early to catch him before us, and we will see you tomorrow night. If we don't see you then, have a great weekend, and we'll catch you again as we go into next week. Thanks so much, guys. We're out of here. Bye, everyone. Camo Specs, they, they just give you your VIP status. <laughs>